My lord, boomed Hostine Frey. We know the man who did this, killed this boy and all the rest. Not by his own hand, no. He is too fat and too craven to do his own killing, but by his word. He turned to Wyman Manderley. Do you deny it? The Lord of White Harbor bit a sausage in half. I confess. He wiped the grease from his lips with his sleeve. I confess I know little of this poor boy. Lord Ramsay's squire, was he not? How old was the lad? Nine on his last name day. So young, said Wyman Manderley. Though mayhaps this was a blessing. Had he lived, he would have grown up to be a fray. Sir Hostine slammed his foot into the tabletop, knocking it off its trestles back into Lord Wyman's swollen belly. Cups and platters flew, sausages scattered everywhere, and a dozen Manderley men came cursing to their feet. Some grabbed up knives, platters, flagons, anything that might serve as a weapon. Sir Hostine Frey ripped his long sword from its scabbard and leapt toward Wyman Manderley. The Lord of White Harbor tried to jerk away, but the tabletop pinned him to his chair. The blade slashed through three of his four chins in a spray of bright red blood. Lady Walda gave a shriek and clutched at her lord husband's arm. Stop! Roose Bolton shouted. Stop this madness! His own men rushed forward as the Manderleys vaulted over the benches to get at the frays. One lunged at Sir Hostine with a dagger, but the big knight pivoted and took his arm off at the shoulder. Lord Wyman pushed to his feet, only to collapse. Old Lord Locke was shouting for a maester as Manderley flopped on the floor like a clubbed walrus in a spreading pool of blood. Lord Wyman Manderley may not survive the winds of winter, and, well, he nearly got killed right there. In this opening quote we showed you in A Dance with Dragons, this Theon chapter. And prior to that scene, he mentions his failing health to Davos. But even though he doesn't give the impression that he expects to live much longer, he surely expects his house and city to do so. He's loyal to his family as much or more than he is to House Stark, which is saying something given his memory, you know, the North remembers, of course. But whatever happens to him, House Manderley will go on without him, and White Harbor will stand. I think. <laughs> it's fair to say that Wyman Manderley has all this very well thought out. Mostly. In addition to the opening quote, Lord Wyman famously utters the phrase, the North Remembers, right? And we love it so much. San has got me covered with my shirt here for the North Remembers. But there are older beings, much older, and much more Northern, and they remember as well. And they've been waiting much longer than he has. That doesn't bode well. Lord Wyman can't help his family after he's dead. The dead in general can't really help the living. But in Westeros, the dead can kill the living and make them allies. <laughs> That's the sad elephant in the room. In many rooms, really, all over Westeros. Westeros is filled with rooms with sad elephants. New information for you all. But really, so many well-laid plans made by the living are not only being set up to be ruined by the plans of the dead, but heck, the plans of the living aren't even taking into account the dead and their plans. Lord Wyman has prepared really well for the Boltons, the Freys, Stannis, Rickon, Winter, the rest of the North in general, but he hasn't spared one solitary thought that we know of for the White Walkers. In that, he's not unique at all. A lot of people have failed to prepare for this threat they're not aware of, but that's still a huge problem because, frankly, I'd say the Walkers are probably a bigger threat than all those other things I just named combined. But the rest of Westeros has something the Manderleys in the North don't. They'll have some time. It might not be enough time, but they do have it. Once they hear that the others have invaded the North, they'll at least be able to maybe prepare, at least have a chance to get ready. Whether they take advantage of that chance is a whole nother matter, but they will have it. The North, however, hmm, not so much. They've forgotten the true enemy, and they are not unlikely to be caught very much off guard, very much unprepared, very much having torn each other apart through infighting, thus very much unable to stop this powerful supernatural force. So in this episode, we will explore House Manderley, their relation to other big houses like House Targaryen and House Stark, and how that's all going to play out in the endgame. Their main role in the main series to this point, 
Minus events we've already spoken of in other episodes like the Battle of Ice series that we did and the North Remembers as East vs. Chapter episode, we'll profile the current Manderleys, their history, and what might be up next for them, give it Stannis, the Boltons and the Freys, Skagos, Davos, Rickon, the rest of the North, all those other things we mentioned, all the while building up to the climax of this episode, which is something we see as inevitable. What happens when the cold winds freeze the White Knife and the White Walkers come to White Harbor. Hello and Valar Sustainus. I've got a new saying thanks to one of our patrons, one of our faceless men patrons who remain anonymous but couldn't help but give him a shout out because you know last time I asked or at least expressed that I need a new thing to say at the beginning. I got the Valar reread us down. That's a good little way to exit each episode, good way to sign off. But I don't have a Valar something for the beginning. So Sustainus was suggested. I like that. Y'all let me know what you think. And also, speaking of our patrons, we have a Nymeria episode planned for the future. That is one of the perks of being a faceless person. You get votes on our upcoming episodes. So in this case, it's probably going to be multiple episodes. So look out for that after Blood Raven 2, which is going to come up next. This episode of History of Westeros podcast is brought to you by our patrons, including Jeff Gnarly, the Long Snapper, History of Westeros' First Sword, our Dragon Rider patrons, Lord Mark of House Joseph, the Snow in Winterfell, Rider of Masla Cartho, a white dragon with green scales, horns, wings, and talents, Talanys the Talon, King of Gagasos, Rider of Talarius, a red dragon with scales, horns, and talons of midnight black, Jinx of House Lier, Green Queen of the Rainwood, rumored daughter of a woods witch, Rider of Erogenia, a sylphic albino dragon with amethyst eyes and opalescent wings. And introducing Sir Max of House Rosebells, Lord of High Lily, wielder of the Dawn Spike, a Valyrian Steel Lance, protector of production, and Hand of the Queen. History of Westeros is part of the Agora Podcast Network, a network of podcasters bringing you a wide variety of content. All members of the Agora Network have a high production standard and release quality episodes on a regular basis. This month's Agora show is the Friday 15 podcast. Rayfield Brown brings you interviews and good music. It's a show where Royfield speaks to friends and interesting people with the backdrop of great music. There's an episode including yours truly, in fact. Introducing Intellectual Linear Progression. Have you ever wanted to read the best books or greatest, most influential books in the history of Western civilization? Well, join OnlineGreatBooks.com and start your journey to becoming well-read. They'll help you develop a habit of reading the greats for three hours each week. It's a community that supports you in your reading and encourages you along the way. Not unlike what we have here with the Song of Ice and Fire community, but a different style of reading. We're talking Homer, Plato, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, a lot of the big heavy hitters from history. So if you're interested in tackling the greats, go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash ref slash wes. That's onlinegreatbooks.com slash ref slash wes, and use the promo code wes. There's also a link on our website, historyofwesteros.com. One added benefit of a two-part episode is that when a detail or a fun fact gets missed, we get the chance to point that out in part two. Here's a fun one. Merling is a word that Martin made up based on the existing terms mermaid and merman. Mir, spelled M-E-R-E, is Old English for the sea. It also stems from the Proto-Indo-European word for the sea, mori. And ling, on the other hand, is a standard Germanic suffix. This all fits with his use of words like princeling, lordling, and sweetling, or a word like wildling, which in the real world is applied to wild animals. No wonder the free folk don't call themselves that. Merling Ambitions As White Harbor prospered and House Manderley grew to be a fixture, history began to repeat itself a bit. The Manderleys gradually became more and more powerful, and as their wealth and influence grew, their position seemingly secure, they began to climb up the proverbial power ladder. Surely there were many marriages and plots and some small-scale wars and battles, things like that. But also clearly, the Manderleys didn't repeat their early mistake back in the reach of overreaching. Overreaching? Over the reach? Yeah, there's some pun in there somewhere. Or they wouldn't be around anymore, right? They... It's almost like this time they learned their lesson and climbed a few rungs short of the top of the ladder and just set up there. Those last few rungs are the most dangerous anyway. There's plenty of profit and greatness to be had just below the top where you're not as much of a target. Not that the North is apolitical, but it would be fair to say the Lords of the North tend to be more straightforward in their dealings. 
But House Manually's history wasn't really shaped by that attitude, since they're not originally from the North. So I would think that in many ways, they kind of overmatch the Northern Houses when it comes to intrigue, their experience as a house, kind of passing on how this works, you know, fathers and sons and mothers and daughters, learning this over the eons and passing it down to each other. In the North, they just don't have as much opportunity to do that. And I guess that's a good thing. But for the Manderleys, this works out pretty well because they're kind of ahead of the game. Outside of violence, the North has largely been stable at the top. There's just a lot less intrigue for that reason. That's one part of it. But courts of the South feature a lot more backstabbing, brinksmanship, things like that. Just a lot more intrigue in general, you could say. The Manderleys brought a wealth of gold and the ability to make more with their skills and the great location of their city. But this experience in power politics may have been even more valuable. It's hard to say. Certainly very valuable, even if it's hard to rank them specifically. Setting aside, say, the Boltons and Lady Dustin, there must always be a Stark in Winterfell is a quote that seems to be quite agreeable to most of the North, as far as we know. But there was no, there must always be a gardener at Highgarden <laughs> that we know of, or there must always be a Durandon at Storm's End, uh, or a Baratheon at Storm's End, anything like that. Never heard anything like that, except in the North for the Starks. Maybe the gardener should have marketed that phrase back in the day. Maybe that would keep them, maybe they'd be still around if so. <laughs> so while there are certainly events unknown to us, given what we do know, the millennia before the Manderleys arrived were much more turbulent than the millennia after in the north, which seemed to pass by at least more smoothly for the city and its rulers. With the Manderleys all but completely integrating themselves into northern society while keeping several southern traditions. Here you can see our lovely Manderley sigil again, looking good. One of which, of course, southern traditions, I mean, is playing the Game of Thrones. It's, it's a part of how it works down there, right? <laughs> but the Manderleys seemed wise enough to learn from the mistakes of their predecessors, and they have been smart in how they play the game, or perhaps wise, or maybe a little of both. They know their limits. At least it seems that way. As things stand in A Song of Ice and Fire, they are pushing those limits a bit, and we're pretty excited to see the results of that, and that's going to be a big part of this episode. Looking at their history as a whole, though, they seem pretty good at taking opportunity where it presents itself without overreaching. Nothing like having a famous overreach in your family's past as a constant reminder not to make that mistake again. House words are a surefire way to keep something from being forgotten. The Boltons won't ever forget to hone their swords, for example. And the Starks won't be fooled by any long summers because of their house words. Well, we don't know what the Manderleys' house words are. I'm sure they have them, and maybe we'll find out what they are. And maybe it will include this kind of warning or something else interesting. Looking forward to finding it out, whatever it is. It's getting bigger all the time. I will remind you all that... When I say a thousand years ago, which I had so much fun saying so many times last episode, it's not necessarily super accurate. It might be 1,200 years or 800 or, or even more or less. It's all the fog of history, meaning some of these things that we talked about in part one may line up in an even more interesting way or at least in a more unexpected way. I'm sure it's cool however it lines up, but as we get closer to current times, we gain a lot more certainty with regard to the timeline. We start to see milestone events with fairly precise dates, and the closer we get to modern times, the more precise those dates tend to be. But one of the most famous ones that was still a while ago was, very famous really, the Doom of Valyria, which was about 400 years before current times. As a trading center, White Harbor likely had a lot of commerce from Essos. Still does, most certainly. By the time the Doom struck, though, White Harbor had been around for four to five centuries at the least, so it was probably pretty well established even though it's more established now. But that growth and trade all around the area was probably very much disrupted by the doom. That's just too big an event, even though it was on another continent. The century of blood which ensued after the doom had wide-ranging impacts. But cities like Bravos were never ruled by Valyria in the first place and may have picked up the slack a bit. I would guess the luxury goods market was probably impacted the most. The commoners of Essos would suffer from the doom. Westerosi commoners far, far less so. 
it wouldn't matter as much to them. But still, just about everyone would feel the effects of one way or another of, you know, this giant cataclysm, such as the nature of world-sweeping events like that. And about as famous and well-dated as the Doom, and more relevant to Westeros, is Aegon's Conquest, which modern dating is based on, so, you know, that's important. Presumably, when Aegon and his dragons came, the Manderleys fortified White Harbor more than they ever had before, and may have joined in the northern host that marched south. If Torrin Stark hadn't bent the knee, White Harbor may have burned. The mighty jetty wall and new castle may have held out against the Targaryen fleets, but they would have no answer for dragon flame. The Wolf's Den would see new horrors, and the ancient weirwood would probably burn along with it. Good thing that didn't happen. Given that we hear of King Torrin's deliberations, meaning that he didn't immediately surrender, and he obviously never decided to fight, but he was entertaining it, the possibility. But he heard arguments from others, like his brother and some maesters, Maybe a Manderley, or maybe multiple Manderleys made their case. They'd certainly be up there among the people that the king in the north would listen to as such a powerful vassal. Or you got to listen to your powerful vassal's opinions. I would strongly guess the Manderleys suggested bending the knee. Again, they don't want their city burned. They have maybe more to lose than most. And Torrin Stark knew he could not likely beat the dragons. And also knew that a host larger than what he brought had already been defeated by said dragons. Lord or Lady Manderley, if not, say, a child at the time, which would be the one way that the Manderleys wouldn't have a say here, is if their lord was a child. They would see little loss and surrender here. I, I don't know that they would mind the North being ruled from King's Landing as much as the rest of the North would. Surely they would probably prefer to keep their close relationship to the King instead of submitting to a King who lives much farther away and they don't have a relationship with. But still, that's better than your city burning, right? And they, you just can't get around that. Also, Aegon had given evidence by how he handled his other defeated enemies, especially the ones that surrendered, that they would be treated fairly. So they had plenty of reason to think that surrendering was the right option, even though it was very unpalatable. So I'm guessing the Manderleys had a lot to say and pushed for peace. Here's something else, though, a little mini-theory. I wonder what the Manderleys at the time thought when they heard that House Gardner, the ones who caused them to flee the South in the first place, were made extinct at the Field of Fire. That might have felt a little bit like having the last laugh. It's like, hey, nah, we outlasted you. You chased us from our home, but now you're gone, and we're still standing. Or at least kneeling, in this case. A huge celebration feast may have been in order. Maybe a few cries for House Peak to be next, if they still cared about the peaks. But, you know, these houses really hold on to their grudges. So I think that maybe they did. And the peaks are going to be suffering quite a few reversals of fortune down the line during this episode it, it, for a lot of it you'll see so they are a minor house now instead of being in the level of greatest so they did drop off quite a bit Manderleys really outlasted their southern enemies it wasn't just the gardeners who ended in flame that day on the field of fire it was this mysterious order of the green hand that also saw its end almost except for house Manderley who still claim membership in the order of the green hand to this day, while well, no one else does. Realizing that they were the last of that ancient order may have been a point of pride. It certainly makes them sound fancier today. They get to add it to their long, long title. Now, the conquest, of course, had an even bigger impact on trade and on White Harbor than the Doom, or just about anything else, really. One immediate impact was the closing of the White Harbor Mint. In the Clash of Kings, Wyman Manderley suggested reopening it now that there was a new king in the north to make coins for. So I assume the king who knelt was the last to have coins minted in his name. Lord Wyman never did actually reopen the mint, despite his suggestion to do so, and the suggestion being taken as a good one, it was never put into action. We know this because when Davos shows up at White Harbor, in A Dance with Dragons, he sees the mint is being used as a home for refugees. So, no minting, just uh, people fleeing the bad things happening in the north. It would have been cool 
if there were some Rob Stark coins made before he died, but it does not seem to be the case. I suppose it's not too late for that to happen down the line. It'd be a way to honor the founder of this new kingdom of the North and Rivers. But that would mean this kingdom survives. And if you're like me, you don't have a whole lot of confidence that the kingdom of North and Rivers will exist at the end of the series. Hmm. To mint coins, you need metal. And there are no gold mines in the North that we know of. Silver, however, definitely. We don't have details. We just know there's silver in the North. I wonder if this means there's nearby silver mines to White Harbor, because if they're doing the minting, well, they need that raw material, and we know that, <laughs> the, that Lord Wyman has uh, full vaults. He claims that his vaults are full of silver. I believe him. And I wonder who was minting coins in the North prior to the Manderleys. Where was this supply of silver, and where was this mint? Maybe Barrowton, which had more power and prestige in ancient times? Either way, right now, that is happening at White Harbor. In the longer term, unity among the Seven Kingdoms would very much likely improve profits. The establishment of King's Landing, which quickly grew to be the most populous city in Westeros, may have hurt some businesses while helping others. There would still be a huge number of goods available nowhere else but the North, and those would be in demand all over the Seven Kingdoms and the world at large. Amber, rare wood, furs, just to name a few. Thus, we expect did White Harbor continue to grow and flourish under this new system, under this new king, under the Iron Throne. The pain of their flight was not forgotten, but I guess it was gone for the most part. It had been a long time. As were the local horrors that afflicted the White Knife for so long. Maybe. Or maybe they were just gone and not forgotten. In the Sworn Sword, we hear of a Lord Wyman Weber who has a cousin, Wendell. Surely this is Martin giving a nod to Lord Wyman Manderley and his son, Wendell. But it's also a reminder that these names are still in use in the South. A Swim with Dragons An indication of just how powerful House Manderley had grown comes to us early in the Targaryen era. Indeed, the Manderleys went on being adopted Northerners until they went and did something decidedly Southern. They may have learned their lesson about overreach, but no one taught them not to swim or dance with dragons. Just don't do any sort of motion with dragons. No activity with dragons at all is probably the right way to do it. Northerners getting involved with the goings-on in King's Landing certainly isn't unheard of, but if A Game of Thrones, meaning book one, told us anything, it's that it's certainly not common, and it normally doesn't end well. It started harmlessly enough on in the Targaryen reign. Aegon I himself let each region rule themselves the way they wanted, kind of a way to break them in easily. So while there was a bit of turmoil in the north over the king who knelt, it was probably business and usual in White Harbor. Their liege lord was at peace, and they follow their liege, and peace is good for business anyway. So I highly doubt the Manderleys had anything to do with any of that turmoil. They were probably on the side pushing for stability, pushing back against the unsatisfied rebels. We hear of a Company of the Rose, a sellsword company that formed through northerners who rejected rule by the Iron Throne. Well, they left the north, so I guess they weren't too problematic since they were in another continent. But still, this is you know, gives you an idea of the kind of things that were happening, the kind of reaction people had to Tor and Stark kneeling. I can, I almost wonder, think about this Company of the Rose. How did they get to Essos? Maybe through White Harbor. That's the best place to travel through the north. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Lord Manderley gave them nice cheap passage to make sure they all left. Aegon the Conqueror made a point to visit all the kingdoms during his life, which was a pretty long life. He survived quite a while after the conquest. But one of the last visits he made was to the north. So I would guess confidently that he set foot in White Harbor itself, too. Quite possibly with Balerion. I mean, he probably traveled with his dragon most places, right? You gotta instill that fear. You gotta remind people why you're king in the first place. And Balerion, I mean, what better way to do that than with your massive dragon? But we don't hear of any relationships or entanglements developing yet. Not at this point. Certainly the Mandalays would want to get in good with the king, but it didn't come with any direct connections that we know of at this time. Such connections would come. It wouldn't be that much longer, but the death of the Conqueror himself led to a lot of instability first. But smartly, House Manderley seemed to avoid 
all of that, or at least most of that. They, the, the, the times of Anis and Magor were very troubled, and the North in general seems to have stayed out of that whole business. From the Northern perspective, it was really just the Targaryens fighting each other, and then the Faith. Magor the Cruel didn't go to war with the Werewoods, though there might have been a few in the North wondering if that was next, if he was going to fight the faith and then turn on the old gods? Probably not, because the worshippers of the old gods weren't causing him problems like the faithful were. Either way, that never happened. King Magor had his hands full. Still, this is where we should give a bit of consideration, because the Manderleys were the only major followers of the Seven up north, and the warrior's sons, the same order Cersei restored, foolishly, in A Feast for Crows, were Magor's biggest foes back then, and they had chapter houses in the cities all around Westeros. You can see on the map here where those were. And you'll notice that White Harbor wasn't one of them. So the only city that didn't have a chapter house, and that's very interesting. So House Manderley brought the faith with them to the north, but they wisely left the most devout, the most zealous behind. It would be hard for the Seven, the religion of the Seven, to take root in the North anyway. So the last thing you need is people who insist on that happening. Zealots are also just kind of bad for business. They're not good for profit, right? These guys are trying to make money as merchants. Religious strife, also not so great for business. So if they were to push this religion and a lot of the locals push back against it, that's just not good. I could even imagine the warrior's sons taking a trip to White Harbor saying, Hey, Lord Manderley, we want to set up a chapter house here. And the Manderleys will say, eh, We'll get back to you on that. Maybe next year. And then repeating that every year and just saying, Yeah, next year. In perpetuity until the order just conveniently ceased to exist thanks to Magor and Jaehaerys. Though staying out of the succession crisis worked out really well, the ensuing peace is when we suspect House Manderley first got in bed with the Targaryens. Jaehaerys the Conciliator had the King's Road built. That's huge. And other roads. And this stretches all the way to the Wall, passing Winterfell on the way. A road through the forbidding and difficult neck opened the north in a manner similar to how White Harbor did. First you get this great port that gives access to everybody. Now you have a road. So you gotta think, this is a huge part in kind of bringing the north into the rest of the realm in an in a important way. Started that journey even more. Though Aegon the Conqueror and his sons after him did allow each kingdom to keep their old laws, his grandson Jaehaerys had a different plan. He wanted to unify the realm and standardize laws. Physically uniting the realm with roads was part of this plan. Now, this surely would have had a big impact on White Harbor as well, not just the North in general, but more than the other realms, I would think, because the other kingdoms being in the South as they were already had so much in common with each other culturally, especially with religion and things like that. The North would have had more adjusting to do. This was a big change for them. You got much more Southerners coming up to do business, much more Southerners just hanging around, etc. Had human sacrifice not already died out at that point somewhat recently? Well, surely that wouldn't fly anymore. Not out in the open anyway. Not with the Targaryen kings coming north and checking everything out. They would not be okay with that. But what the South doesn't see can't hurt them. What happens up on the banks of the White Knife in the deep forests and high places stays up the banks of the White Knife in the deep forests and high places. Traditions die hard, especially religious ones, especially ones that really work. <laughs> it's one thing in the real world where that gets questioned a lot, justifiably, but this is a realm of magic. So these things do have an effect. But however they held on to these old traditions, whether in secret or whether it really did die out, this is where the North could no longer stay out. They weren't forced to go south. They weren't forced into a war they didn't want to be a part of. The South came to them. You can't ignore that. Not only with their big fancy roads, but like I said, they came in person with their trade and their culture and their religion. And though they came in peace, they also came in force. Again, we speak of the old king and his good queen Alisande, who brought half their court and six dragons when they came to visit. Good way to make sure any discomfort over new laws and such isn't argued with too much. 
Though the Starks did argue with the Iron Throne over the gift, they may have covered all the bases by aiming to keep the Starks' most powerful ally on the sidelines, or on their side. Yeah. Remember how White Harbor, we've theorized, was a check on the Bolton's ambitions? Well, that we also pointed out how that can cut both ways. Princess Viserra Targaryen, daughter of King Jaehaerys and good Queen Alysanne, was betrothed to the Lord Manderly of that time. That time being sometime between 75 and 95 AC. We don't know when this famous visit was, or if it was directly connected to this betrothal. I would put that towards the earlier time of those of that range because this, uh, both of them were pretty old around 95 and thus probably didn't do nearly as much traveling around then. So I would guess towards the earlier part of that range. In any case, we don't know if this visit was directly connected to this marriage arrangement. Probably was, but it's not a sure thing. It would also be interesting to know what kinds of stark Manderly marriages had taken place in the recent past or concurrently to this marriage to the Targaryens. We do have some examples of stark Manderly marriages later on. They're also going to be later on in this episode. Regardless, this marriage of Merlin and Dragon never actually took place. Princess Viserra was slightly on the wild side and died whilst racing a horse through the streets of King's Landing. She had been drinking. So this is basically the Westerosi version of drunk driving and dying during it. Tragic for all involved, but maybe good luck for House Manderly in a twisted sort of way. Missing out on the Targaryen marriage... You know, that could have been a blessing in disguise. You never know what entanglements having royal blood can get you into. You got people pushing your claims, people coming at you with their ambitions in mind. It doesn't always go great. But the Mandalays weren't done, and there may have been more to that betrothal. Meaning maybe there was some other arrangement, as often there is with these marriage alliances. Maybe a Mandalay joined the King's Guard. Maybe a Mandalay joined the Small Council. Certainly happened later. Point is, if the Targaryens wanted to make sure the Starks played nice, a marriage to their most powerful vassal, the Manderlees, is a great way to keep the Starks in check. It takes that ally away from the Starks and gives it to the Targaryens, or at least makes them neutral. It makes it hard for them to take a side. Fire and Blood, out November 20th, which you can pre-order on our website, historyofwesteros.com, should give a lot more detail into a lot of these scenarios And I'd be surprised if the Mandalays don't come up at least a few times, which would help fill some of this out. Someday down the line, we'll come back and fill in these details. Whatever they are, they're bound to be there. They're too important not to be a part of this. Also, maybe it was just a great fit for the Targaryens. There's a lot of other things about this marriage that make sense. You know, there's the whole bit about keeping the North tied to them. But there's also the fact that the cultural differences are really big. The religion and all that. And remember what we said about the history of Northern Houses getting too involved in the South. House Manderley is the perfect middle ground because they have that southern tradition attached to them. So it's less of a cultural barrier to overcome. White Harbor is a bit like a cultural estuary. you got southern attitude, northern alliance, northern stuff, southern stuff, all together. It all fits pretty well. And maybe they thought they could trust the Manderleys more than the Starks. Maybe because of these cultural differences, but maybe also because the Manderleys are profit-minded. Where the Starks are ruling-minded and they weren't happy about kneeling more to worry about, in other words. And the Starks had something pretty important to be upset about, too. It wasn't just the kneeling, it was the things that the new regime made them do that they didn't like, such as this whole issue with the gift. After all, they were plenty ready to get back to independence when Rob Stark and the Opportunity came along then. That was several hundred years later, but still, this attitude of being different than the South and wanting to rule themselves has kind of always been around. From here, it just gets going even more. The pace accelerates. And this is important, too, because this is also the time when House Targaryen is basically at its height of power. Obviously, they'd be the most powerful house in Westeros for long after they took the throne. But this is really their peak. Jaehaerys, with Alysanne and Septon Barth, managed the realm extremely well and set it up to have a lot of benefits for future generations. Not just the cities and towns of the realm, but the economic policy being well-managed, the roads 
Barth was particularly progressive with his knowledge of sewage and water management, and some of that knowledge probably spread to other cities. With the relationship of House Manderley and House Targaryen, maybe the maesters of White Harbor and the lords of White Harbor had lots of conversations with Barth about doing some of those things at White Harbor. We do know now that White Harbor is considered the cleanest of all the cities. So I think there's a good reason to suspect that they're a bit on top of things as far as keeping the city clean. During 101 AC, a great council was summoned to settle the matter of inheritance for Jaehaerys' throne after his second son died. His first son had already died, and the succession was unclear because of both of those sons had descendants of their own. Many came forth, but the only two serious candidates were Prince Viserys, who is Jaehaerys' grandson through that second son who just died, and Laenor Valerian, his great-grandson through his first son. Despite nearly all the lords and ladies of Westeros worth anything attending this council, the current Lord Manderly was one of the very few specifically mentioned to be in attendance, along with his neighbors, the Starks and the Dustins of Barrington. All three families supported the claim of Laenor, despite many others seeing a problem with his candidacy. In many people's eyes, the fact that his descent was through his mother was problematic, and she had already been passed over nine years prior. So why are we circling back to her if she had already been passed over? Why are her descendants getting called? Well, that's kind of what these great councils do. They argue all these things out. But what ended up happening was the Northerners backed the wrong side. They backed the losing side. Maybe not the wrong side, but certainly the losing side. Uh, Viserys was eventually named Prince of Dragonstone and heir to the throne. They didn't dispute the results, swore allegiance, honoring the results of the Great Council. They did what they had to. According to many, but not all, this established a precedent that a woman could never inherit the Iron Throne. But Viserys immediately went against that by naming his daughter his heir. And it didn't change it even after he had sons. Before those sons were born, Viserys had many lords swear oaths to Rhaenyra, including House Manderley. And this is where the problems come up. Ha, think of Jamie and, you know, conflicting oaths. The king's word is supposed to be law, so, you know, where I fall on this is that they needed to follow his wishes. You know, I don't agree with monarchy as a style of government, but in being consistent with it, well, the king's word is law. But half the realm or more went against that upon his death, and boom, the Dance of the Dragons was on. The Manderleys proved that their oaths trumped interpretations of the law or any belief that women shouldn't inherit. They kept their word. Even though we never hear of a queen in the north, and even though the north backed Laenor over Viserys, they backed Viserys' daughter over Viserys' son, again, because they swore to. It was an oath they kept seriously. And it's a harbinger of future loyalty and future oath keepings, even though it refers to a promise made well before any of this. The promise, in fact. When the Dance of the Dragons began in earnest, you might think the Manderleys would head south. But fortunes were reversed, as it was the Targaryens who traveled north. Instead of King Jaehaerys, this time they welcomed Prince Jaehaerys, who flew to White Harbor aboard his dragon Vermax. He had already visited the Aarons, the Borels at Sisterton, and would then go on to this trip to see the Starks at Winterfell. Since Jacarius was the eldest of Rhaenyra's kids, he was the heir to the throne if his mother won it. So these houses were all very much honored by his coming. That's usually a big deal when the crown prince comes to visit. Jacarius' mission was obvious, to drum up support for his faction, the Blacks, which was the loyalist side that supported the ascension of Rhaenyra against the Greens of Aegon II and House Tytower and all their team. Prince Jacarius was successful in the Vale, and at Winterfell, and at White Harbor, where Lord Manderley promised warriors commanded by his two sons, described as the fearsome Sir Medric and the clever and corpulent Sir Torin. As usual, I want to take a moment to consider those names. George often chooses character names with careful thought, and I think this might be the case here as well. The name Medric only appears in one other place, and it's the maester to House Hornwood, who appears at Winterfell during A Dance with Dragons. And he's the one to tend to Lord Wyman after Sir Hostine cuts him in the throat, as we see in that uh, opening quote there. 
Sertorin is a more interesting choice of name because it's one shared with the king who knelt, a name that might be a lot less popular given said kneeling for obvious reasons. We already talked about why the North was unhappy with that kneeling. So the fact that the Manderleys gave an important son that name, hmm, kind of important. It might mean something. It might be lingering support for the peace faction back then. But it's fair to say that name is still in use elsewhere. One of Lord Karstark's sons is killed by Jamie Lannister in the Whispering Wood. He was named Torrin. And there's at least one more Torrin Stark in the timeline, uh, rather in the family tree. Not same difference, timeline, family tree. House Manderley and these particular Manderley brothers who were going to be leading the action were not involved too much in the political turmoil that preceded the war, other than, you know, casting their vote, being at the Great Council, but that's it. But they were very much involved once it began. Lord Cregan Stark, later called the Old Man in the North, declared his support early, though he didn't march until later because the North has got to be the North. And what that means is the harvest was too important. You can't go rush off to war when it's the middle of the harvest and the North, they cannot afford to not handle the harvest with all their attention because, well, we know how Stark's words, they're the same then as they were now. Still, the Manderleys and a few others like the Dustins came ahead of the people gathering the harvest. There was a Northern army that came south ahead of the rest, even though it wasn't nearly their full force. The Dance of the Dragons was, of course, terrible for everyone involved. It raged in many corners throughout Westeros, and no one really came out ahead when it was all said and done. But the Manderley brothers seemed to be in the thick of the action in King's Landing, which was a big hot spot throughout the whole span of the war. And they stayed close to Queen Rhaenyra for most of it. Let's check in on some of their exploits. When King's Landing suffered rioting, Sir Medric bravely led a hundred mermen into the streets to restore order in the area between Aegon's High Hill and the Iron Gate. Meanwhile, Sir Torin and his men faced off with the Gutter Knights of Sir Perkin. I love that term, Gutter Knights. It just seems so, it just sort of out of balance, you know? <laughs> Who are really just a bunch of small folk anyway. They, these aren't really knights. They're sellswords and randoms that Sir Perkin just started knighting for the heck of it, really, in Fishmonger Square and River Row. This is where Sir Torrin went, and it didn't work out that great for Sir Torrin. He suffered casualties to a quarter of his men and had to retreat back to the Red Keep. The Manderley brothers erred like so many of Rhaenyra's council when arguing that Dragon Seed's Alan Valerian, who was the writer of Sea Smoke, and Nettles, writer of Sheep Stealer, couldn't be trusted simply because they were bastards, even though they had already loyally served to, in the war to that point. So the Manderleys were no better than most when it comes to prejudice against bastards, it seems. This was a really, really terrible move by Rainier, a real foot-shooting kind of play here, and it's amazing how many of her counselors pushed her into this terrible move. Things didn't really get better in the war, no thanks to that internal strife. Both brothers accompanied Rhaenyra when the storming of the dragon pit forced her to flee the capital entirely. Well, her dragon died too. They were among her last supporters. The princess and the queen. The loss of both her dragon and her son left Rhaenyra Targaryen ashen and inconsolable. She retreated to her chambers whilst her counsellors conferred. King's Landing was lost, all agreed. They must need abandon the city. Reluctantly, her grace was persuaded to leave the next day at dawn. With the mudgate in the hands of her foes, and all the ships along the river burned or sunk, Rhaenyra and a small band of followers slipped out through the Dragon Gate, intending to make their way up the coast to Duskendale. With her rode the brothers Manderley, four surviving Queen's Guard, Sir Balin Birch, and twenty gold cloaks, four of the Queen's ladies in waiting, and her last surviving son, Aegon the Younger. Sir Medric apparently tried to convince Rhaenyra to journey north to White Harbor, but was turned down because she wanted to go to Dragonstone to get another dragon. The Manderleys went to raise more men, presumably, and it's good for them that they did, because if they had gone to Dragonstone with Rhaenyra, well, that didn't go well for her, and the, the best case for them would be taken hostage. Um, it's entirely possible that they would have been killed. Rhaenyra was eaten by... Aegon II's dragon, Sunfire. They survived that and the rest of the worst that was going on, because the Dance of the Dragons was pretty much the worst. 
while their father was back in White Harbor still running things while this was going on. They were probably worried back there that the war might eventually come to White Harbor. There's a, you know, the war could go a lot of different directions, and as a big target, they had to worry a little. So they probably breathed a collective sigh of relief when the brothers arrived home, and it became clear that no dragons were going to come to burn White Harbor. If Rhaenyra had come with them as they wanted, that might have been a fear. Although, to be fair, it probably wouldn't have been a legitimate fear. You're saying, Aziz, why wouldn't that have been a legitimate fear? Why wouldn't the dragons have come to burn White Harbor with Rhaenyra there? Well, because this point in the story, this point during the dance, pretty much all the dangerous dragons were dead, wild, or severely injured. In fact, the one that ate Rhaenyra was one of those severely injured ones. He wasn't uh, going to go flying off attacking any cities. But earlier in the war, it was a real possibility. So that fear was legitimate, was founded, at least at a good portion of the war. But despite the lack of dragons, the Greens were still a faction, and they had just taken out Rhaenyra. But also, despite Rhaenyra's death, the war was not over, and to make it worse, winter had come. It had started partway through the dance and had gotten worse progressively. It got bad enough that there was starvation. So you see, earlier, when Lord Cregan Stark kept most of his men in the north, to f take the harvest in, well, that's a good thing they did because this winter was bad. There was starvation even though they stayed there and kept collecting the harvest. So even though Rhaenyra was dead, not all on her side had surrendered. And it wasn't long before Aegon II proved himself horribly unfit. With the Starks finally on the march after marshalling a huge host, things looked to turn around quickly. Rhaenyra was dead, but she had a son alive still, plus another alive that she thought was dead, but anyway. Either way, her claim lived on. That's the point. Aegon II took the throne, but the war didn't technically end even though he was crowned, and the Starks were still coming. To prevent further bloodshed, to prevent the war from continuing, to prevent this northern host from having a reason to fight the South or the Green faction, the small council took the easier route and poisoned Aegon II. No need for a war when the claimant's just dead, right? Well, yeah, that's mostly true. Lord Cregan, though, was famously displeased by this. He thought it was improper, and killing a king in battle was right, but poisoning him, not right. So he just kind of came in and took over briefly. The famous Hour of the Wolf saw the executions of many at court, mostly those who were part of the poisoning. I would assume the Mandalays came back south with Lord Cregan during this, after parting ways with Queen Rhaenyra earlier. They wanted to get back into the war, and, you know, their liege lord was marching south. So they were probably there for all these executions, and surely the crowning of the boy king Aegon III. And very quickly, the Mandalays climbed even higher. Sir Torin was named one of Aegon III's original seven Council of Regents after the war was done, after Lord Cregan had returned to Winterfell, that is, and the raging winner that he returned to with his new Blackwood bride, by the way. That's all very notable, though. A knight of House Manderley. Not even the heir to White Harbor at the time became a really highly ranked member of this new regime. This may have been a reward for that really strong, tight loyalty to his mother, Rhaenyra. You would think they'd get rewarded for something, like, and this could be it. Very likely, I would think. But there may have been more that we are not aware of. One of the original seven of this Council of Regents was the aforementioned Lord Corlys Velaryon, the Sea Snake. And when he died, Lord Unwin Peak took his place. This might have been awkward for Sir Torin. The Peaks still own the former Manderly home of Dunstanbury at the time, even though a lot of time has passed, no one had forgotten. The gardeners may have given the order to take the Manderleys out, but it was the Peaks who actually did it. And to make matters worse, Lord Unwin was really not a nice guy. He was arrogant, difficult, and relentless in his attempts to marry Aegon III to his own daughter. Despite all of this, he was made, or forced his way into being made, King's Hand. Forced his hand? Forced their hand? Uh. Well, to make it worse for everyone else, his bastard brother, Peak's bastard brother, that is, was in the King's Guard. So, another guy kind of backing him up, probably. 
I can't imagine Sir Torrin was a fan of either of these guys. But I can't imagine Lord P kind of needling him about who the owner of Dunstanbury is. Him. <laughs> Lord Unwin would at least eventually resign in protest over too many perceived slights. But Sir Torrin was gone by then, and he was probably no longer Sir Torrin, though. Here's another interesting bit. Despite surviving the war, his brother did not survive that nasty long winter, nor did their father. Sir Medric Manderley and their aforementioned father both died of winter fever in 132 AC. And if Medric had heirs of his own, I guess they didn't survive either, or they were too young to rule on their own. Either way, that meant Sir Torrin had to abandon his position at King's Court, probably to take the high chair at the Merman's Court, becoming Lord of White Harbor, or again, helping his nephew or niece do the same. Sometime after that is when Lord Peak left King's Landing. Torrin Manderley must have done a pretty good job back at White Harbor. He must have squared things away well enough, or at least he stayed long enough for his nephew or niece, again, this, who may have existed, for them to come of age. And maybe he had his own sons or daughters or cousins or uncles or aunts or he could trust to leave in charge, right? Oh, a lot of little things are possible here. But in any case, however White Harbor was stabilized after this incident of the winter fever, three or four years later, he came back to be the king's hand. Too bad he didn't replace Lord Peak straight away. That would have been too perfect. But that title moved around a lot, so it wasn't long after Peak left that Manderley got it. Think how long that makes the Manderley title. <laughs> Think of how long it is now, and then add Hand of the King, Protector of the Realm to all that. It's like Daenerys-sized, if you uh, think about it. We don't have time to read the whole thing, but I imagine he found a way to embellish it even more. I would have just used shorthand and called him Handerly. Natch. Lord Torrin was Hand for only about a year or two, maybe even less, which may imply he wasn't that great at it, but it doesn't automatically imply that. It may just be that Aegon III had his own ideas because he came of age while Lord Manderley was Hand. And once the king comes of age during a regency, he gets to do whatever he wants. And it may just be that he didn't want Lord Manderley running things. He had his own ideas. He even walked into the room on his birthday and canceled the feast that was planned for his ascension. He told Lord Manderley, give all that food to the poor. A Manderley forced to give up his dinner. An outrage. An outrage, I say. Presumably, Lord Torrin took the long trip back home again and resumed control of White Harbor from whoever he had left in charge. You know, unless it was his own nephew as Lord of White Harbor. All these little exceptions we have to worry about. But it looks as though the Manderley stayed away from House Targaryen from then on. And Targaryen power began to wane a bit as the dragons died out over the next 20 years. Most of them having already died during the war, but 20 years later, there weren't any. So it's not a bad time to jump ship, or jump dragon, as it were. The Manderleys being wise in the ways of investments, could see that this investment may be not worth as much as it used to be. The long-term outlook, not as good as it once was. We don't know how long Lord Torrin lived, but it is my headcanon that Wyman is a direct descendant of his. Torrin was said to be clever and corpulent, let's recall that, and GRM loves to have traits repeat along these family lines across multiple generations within a house. And this guy was also brave, Torrin, that is. And ambitious. So you got clever, corpulent, ambitious, and brave. Those are traits Lord Wyman all has. Their heart tree, the Manderley heart tree, which we've talked about in a couple other places, also appears to be a bit corpulent. We'll use the fancy word. And we, had, we have a theory explained in our Werewood episodes that the heart trees and the old gods may help explain some of the magic in George R. R. Martin's genetics. So check out our old Werewood episodes. There's two of them at the beginning of our... Uh, religions and magic series. But whether our theory has any basis or not, the Manderleys have certainly married into the North many times, and vice versa. You can't really be of the North if you don't have Northern blood in your veins, right? So of course the Manderleys didn't just dance and swim with dragons, they also made a lot of time for wolves. Merwolves. Martin had this to say back in 2003 about the possibility of Stark cousins out there in the North. 
There are probably some descendants of offshoot branches from the family tree floating around the north, most likely in White Harbor and Barrowton. The Stark family tree doesn't go back far enough in the world of Ice and Fire for us to know how many Stark manually marriages there have been over time, let alone manually marriages to other houses. But let's delve into the examples we do have. In what was probably a political marriage, the Manderleys were right in the middle of a Stark succession situation. Maybe a crisis. It wasn't necessarily one, but it might have been. Perhaps to keep the Manderleys close after seeing the Targaryens nearly marry them away, kind of steal that important alliance, Lord Cregan had his heir, Rickon Stark, marry Lady Jane Manderley. Maybe in the late 140s or early 150s. We're not exactly sure, but it should be roughly in that time frame. We are sure it was interesting and at least a little bit creepy. Rickon was heir to the just mentioned Lord Cregan Stark, but he died during the Young Dragon's conquest of Dorne, circa 157. Before Rickon's death, Lady Jane did have two daughters, though. Serena and Sansa. Both of them immediately married into the tight circle of northern nobles. Perhaps too tight. This gets a bit confusing, but we're keeping our eye on the Manderly line, so that's why we've got some graphics here for y'all. Again, I want to point out to you who listen uh, to us on podcast, I highly recommend the ACAST player. We're not promoting it because we get paid for it. We're promoting it because we get to put images in it, map shots, fan art. So you can be listening to an audio podcast and just pop over and look real quick at your phone or look at it later. The, the images are really easy to scroll through during the episode or after. And this is one of those times where it really comes up because this is a bit confusing, these uh, family trees, but I'll do my best. So Lord Cregan remarried twice for three total marriages. He had his granddaughters Serena and Sansa from the first. Then he added five daughters and four sons from the next two. He apparently named the eldest of those sons as his new heir after Rickon's death, and perhaps to avoid the different lines getting into some kind of Dance of the Wolves type civil war, he combined them as best as he could. Uh, incest be damned. <laughs> this probably proved vital as three of these four sons inherited Winterfell. Had the lines not been combined, we could have seen White Harbor forced into some kind of Stark Civil War like that, like Jaime. Again, we see this example of competing oaths. Break, you're going to break an oath no matter who you support. Which is the true Stark? Which Stark do you support? But as far as we know, they never had to make that choice. But these marriages are... Yeah, they're cutting it close, like I said, on the incest scale. And it's in as incestuous as it is confusing. But again, let's keep our eye on the Manderly bloodline here. Okay, this is where it gets the most confusing. The eldest sister, Serena, married an Umber, probably before this Rickon died. Sansa married Jonal, who was the new heir to Winterfell after Rickon's death. That's Rickon's half-brother. So there's Cregan combining the lines from two of his marriages, as we said. He's uniting, you know, one of his wife's kids and grandkids with another. He combined that further when Serena's umber husband died without children, and then she turned around to marry Jonal's younger brother, Edric. So, yeah, <laughs> it it's works out funny, but you kind of wonder if the Manderleys were used to close marriages like this. Probably they were. It's unclear because we already have examples like Tywin and Joanna. But the Seven seem to have a greater prohibition against incest than the North does, despite the North being very against incest too. Clearly it's accepted to some degree, as we just saw. We got, you know, a niece marrying her half-uncle, and we have Lord Wyman in Game of Thrones, A Clash of Kings, uh, wanting to marry his own cousin, Danella Hornwood, or having his son marry her. Anyway, it was probably easier to accept than blood sacrifice anyway, <laughs> meaning incest is preferable to blood sacrifice, even this minor kind of incest. Though early Manderleys may have seen some blood at northern weddings before the king who knelt. You never know, like, uh, what kind of things they did at northern weddings really back in the day. Um, yeah, I mean, Dothraki weddings have a few deaths. Northern weddings may have had a sacrifice. Entirely possible. But getting back to... This confusing family tree. Cregan had his two granddaughters marry their own half-uncles. But in reverse order, the younger granddaughter married the older half-uncle. And that's because the older one had already been married to an umber and then she remarried after. 
Very confusing. Jonal and Sansa had no kids, but Edric and Serena had four. Two were boys, but for some reason they did not inherit. So I think that's because Edric died before Jonal. Winterfell passed to Jonal, and Edric's younger brother, Barth Blacksword, afterwards. He was never married either. He was killed during the Skagosi Rebellion. So it passed again to this aforementioned fourth brother, finally, someone named Brandon, a familiar Stark name. And of course, he's the one that everything passes through. Because his name is Brandon, right? No. Just because. But at this point, when Brandon is Lord of Winterfell, we're only about a hundred years before the start of A Song of Ice and Fire. So we're getting into somewhat recent history here. But Lord Brandon didn't rule long either. And passed Winterfell onto his porn star named son, Rodwell Stark. Rodwell had a Manderly bride also named Miriam. And again, the merman had a chance to be in-laws to the Lord of Winterfell. But despite his name, his virile name of Rodwell, there were no kids. I blame the Manderly this time. Because how can Rodwell be infertile? Anyway, Rodwell also didn't rule long either. This was the time where the She-Wolves of Winterfell takes place, when there were just a lot of dead Lord Starks all in a close succession, and it caused all kinds of problems. But the Stark line continued through Rodwell's younger brother all the way down to our current Starks. That's where we are now. So despite Sir Marlon Manderly scoffing to Davos at the idea of Ironborn and Wildlings troubling White Harbor, which is something that was said in A Dance with Dragons when Davos is trying to win the Manderleys over to Stannis' cause. Still, over the years, the Manderleys and their men probably have traveled to fight beside the Starks against those exact threats. They may be downplaying it now, but it has mattered to them in the past. They, in particular, fought against Dagon Greyjoy, whose reavers slew Baron Stark. That is Rodwell's younger brother. The Manderleys likely would have sent men to do battle with King Beyond the Wall, Raymond Redbeard, who slew Baron's son, Lord Willem. So, yeah, Marlon Manderley going a little too far with that comment. The Ironborn and the Wildlings may not trouble White Harbor, but they trouble the North, and the Manderleys care about what happens in the North because they're loyal vassals. Normally, when a new king or lord of Winterfell, you know, the top spot in a region, is sworn in, you have a round of homage giving, where they all come around and kneel to the new lord or king. It's pretty typical. In this case, of course, they're reaffirming their loyalty to the Starks. We see this firsthand in A Clash of Kings, but only from the reeds. It's a harvest feast that we see happening when Bran has those chapters where people come around. The only ones who actually pledge that loyalty is the reeds. We get a great example of it. Most of the rest of the lords had already pledged to Rob when he was crowned initially at that famous moment in the second to last chapter in A Game of Thrones. So that homage scene and the harvest feast in general give George the chance to give us details about several northern lords and houses and their capabilities and history and disposition. It's also when we meet Wyman Manderly for the first time, and we do indeed get a good rundown. Let's talk about Wyman Manderly. Wyman Manderley was born at White Harbor around 239 to 242. So around the time that Tywin Lannister and Barristan Selmy are born, and Brynden Rivers is named Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Just for reference, that's where we were. It's not known when Wyman married, but we do know his wife died in 291. We don't know the cause of her death, or even her name, but whoever she was, she had already given birth to two sons, Wendell and Willis, both of whom who would grow to be knights. And Willis had two daughters of his own via marriage to Leona Woolfield. That's Winifred and the young, famous Willa. But we will come back to them in a while. Let's tackle the man himself first. Definitely don't mean that literally. He's too big to tackle. Here we have Art of Wyman and his two granddaughters by Hong Era on Tumblr. Nice one. Despite the nickname, Lord Too Fat to Sit a Horse, it's said that Lord Wyman was pretty good at riding horses and enjoyed it when he was much younger. He even apparently had some success at jousting and different tourneys and things like that. Though he's no longer in physical condition to do that or to even really fight, he did so during Robert's Rebellion. He was at the Battle of the Trident. Even if he did require the services of the old creepy one-legged Sir Bartimus to save his life. In fact, that's apparently how he lost that leg. We get a description of Lord Wyman's hidden military strength, and we'll get to see them in action during the Winds of Winter. We'll see, really, how big this hidden strength is. 
This gives us an idea, though, of what Lord Wyman might have brought with him to the Trident. It might be interesting to see the difference between Manderley Knights and those of the South. Like, are there any differences? Do, you know, have they adapted some Northern aspects to them? If they're kind of a estuary of knighthood and kind of like White Harbor is culturally speaking. I wonder if some of the Manderley men wield actual tridents. We see them armed with such at White Harbor. So that'd be kind of cool. The Manderley men at Ruby Ford could be said to be tridents at the trident. And those who survived that battle and the short remainder of the war would have returned home victorious with Lord Wyman. Lord Stark would return to the North sometime later, and as best as we can tell, White Harbor was business as usual until the start of the series, which is our next section. Though the Manderleys apparently have a fairly unblemished history of support for House Stark, we never hear of any taking the black. Perhaps they've heard how bad the food is. Time to thank a few more people, such as our Blood Rider patron Vorsaki, wielder of a Valyrian steel arak with a dragon bone hilt, and our northern champions, Jay Wilson, Winter's King, Sir Stephen, the Hammer of the North, Winter's King, Lord of the First Men, Lady Ar Ardross, Mother of Wolves, Sir Brian the Returned, Knight of the Last House, wielder of the Valyrian steel blade Red Song, Sir Kobe of House Stonesmith, words are wind, deeds are stone, and Lady Cat Jones of the Big Pond, wielder of the Valyrian steel blade Ginger's Honor. Amazon allows you to pick whichever channels you want and not pay for the others. That includes networks like HBO, Stars, Showtime, CBS All Access, etc. To get a free Amazon Prime TV subscription, go to historyofwesteros.com and look on the right sidebar for the link. In case you missed it, we've been releasing some Con of Thrones panel audio from our trip to Con of Thrones 2018 in Dallas. Sean and Ashea and myself all had panels together and separately. We'll be releasing some of them on our podcast feed. Most of them won't be released as videos, so you're going to want to check out the podcast feed if you normally watch us on YouTube. And some of them will be kept as Patreon only, so if you want to get access to everything, now's the time to join us on Patreon. You can get access to that and other bonuses for as little as a dollar a month. Go to patreon.com slash historyofwesteros. The Modern Manderley The first mention of House Manderley is in Eddard IV. After receiving word from Catelyn about the attack on Bran, Ned prepares for the worst, meaning war. He orders archers to moat Caelan, for Lord Manderley to strengthen and fortify his defenses, and for a close watch to be put on Theon. Because we've covered the future of House Manderley by way of the Battle of Ice series and the Aziz vs. North Remember episodes, as we mentioned at the beginning, part of the trick with this episode is avoiding things that we've already talked about in, in those uh, other episodes. So we're, to do that, we're going to instead focus on current characters and all the important and fun things to know about them, which will help us grasp all these complexities of the Northern storyline as it continues to unfold. I really think we've just begun to see the start of it, even though quite a lot has happened. An interesting trait shared by Lord Wyman and his sons, and with Lord Torrin, and with their Werewood, is the appearance of being overweight. Note that I said the men, as there's no mention of any of Lord Wyman's female kin possessing this, what might be, recurring trait. The martial culture of Westeros tends to look down on overweight men, in part because to most it implies weakness and cowardice. Neither are particularly true in this case, or in general, I suppose, but there can be value in allowing your enemies to underestimate you. When thinking of our main characters who are on the larger side, of course, one of the main characters to think of is Samuel Tarley. Sam's weight is tied very heavily into his own self-worth and how others see him. Right from A Game of Thrones, Sir Alistair gives him the name Sir Piggy. Sam's weight, and to be fair, he is a coward. Well, he starts off as one. He certainly evolves into something much more. But at that point, it's he's a little more one or two dimensional and he's pretty clearly cowardly. And this is a major reason why a lot of people dislike him at first. Casting him off as weak or useless. And this theory doubles up in Sam's debut POV chapter in A Storm of Swords on the retreat from the Fist of the First Men. This is an idea of how this gets thought about. He's our only POV um, for this sort of thing. Sam won A Storm of Swords. If only I was stronger. He wasn't, though, and it was no good wishing. Sam was weak and fat, so very fat. He could hardly bear his own weight. The mail was much too much for him. It felt as though it was rubbing his shoulders raw, despite the layers of cloth and quilt between the steel and skin. The only thing he could do was cry. And when he cried, 
The tears froze on his cheeks. Sam, no doubt due to his father Randall, places his own worth in his physique. And it's no wonder when the whole world seems to agree with him. People make the same assumptions all over Westeros about people like him, and that would apply to Wyman Manderly as well, such as these nicknames. This is especially true in the North, where strength matters even more, toughness matters even more, and where starvation is a thing. It's kind of odd to see an overweight guy where in a place where there's the threat of starvation. But the names matter too. Tarly is a big name, so is Manderly. So it's fair to say that Sam really is full of fear, although he's learned to fight back against it. But Lord Wyman, I don't see much fear for him at all. His fear is almost entirely an act. He has concerns, he has things he wants to do right, but that doesn't mean he's afraid. He was waiting for the right moment. That moment seems to have come. But it's not just going to be about him. It's going to be about his family. The consequences for his actions will play out for them and his city. So let's take a look at them. But we're not done with him, so we'll start with him. The Lord of White Harbor Lord Wyman's first appearance is in A Clash of Kings, Bran II. He arrives for the Harvest Feast at Winterfell while much of the North is warring in the South. He immediately comes off as friendly and makes Bran feel comfortable. So at first glance, Wyman is easily dismissed due to his extreme obesity and the perception that he's not capable of defending himself. And the Northern ideal is more like guys like Eddard of normal size or big dudes like the Great John. Yet, despite this, Lord Manderly commands scores of loyal guards, he hides tons of military power, and is inarguably accomplished. I would say that he's a lot smarter than those people we mentioned, too. It's no secret that playing the Game of Thrones is a much more southern trait than northern. Again, look at how bad Ned did down there. Look at how bad a lot of them handled it. No one gave Rob good advice for the most part. But that doesn't mean that northerners don't get involved in politics from time to time. They just aren't as good at it. They all still want lands and honor and whatever else they can get. And we have Roose Bolton and Arnolf Karstark and guys like that who were not honorable at all. And Wyman Manderly, though, is lucky enough to have both southern and northern connections with all this wealth to back it up. So he kind of plays it up. He intentionally does this jolly fat man act. His laugh is referred to as booming, and he's at ease playing the, quote, amiable lord that Bran welcomes at Winterfell, and the same act that appeases the phrase at the beginning of A Dance with Dragons. But in both those cases, he's actually making moves. And he is a bit graceful. In the North Rivers chapter, we compared him to Illyrio and Varys at the same time. I go very deep with these comparisons. But there's one particular connection to that I want to remind you of here, which is that he dances gracefully with Beth Cassell during the Harvest Feast. And that's a great reminder of Illyrio. So just remember, just because someone's big like that doesn't mean they can't have moves. Let us look to Wyman's first appearance of the series at Winterfell, A Clash of Kings, which we touched on a bit earlier. This is that harvest feast. Let's be more specific, though, here. It's mentioned that Wyman brings a long list of retainers to Winterfell, full of knights and squires and lesser lords, even musicians and jugglers, all things that mm, an eight-year-old boy might be drawn to. As usual, faithful Sir Roderick says something poignant here. Bran too, a clash of kings. The feast makes a pleasant pretext, Sir Roderick explained. But a man does not cross a hundred leagues for a sliver of duck and a sip of wine. Only those who have matters of import to set before us alike to make the journey. So Wyman is more than courteous to Bran and keeps up some happy chatter before the, quote, matters of import get brought up, which is, in this case, a casual mention of Danella Hornwood. Bran too, a clash of kings. While tearing apart a bird with fat fingers, Lord Wyman made polite inquiry after Lady Hornwood, who was a cousin of his. She was born a mandolino. you know. Perhaps when her grief has run its course, she would like to be a mandolino again, eh? He took a bite from a wing and smiled broadly. As it happens, I am a widower these past eight years. Past time I took another wife, don't you agree, my lords? A man does get lonely. 
tossing the bones aside. He reached for a leg. Or if the lady fancies a younger lad, well, my son Wendell is unwed as well. He is off south guarding Lady Catelyn, but no doubt he will wish to take a bride on his return. A valiant boy and jolly. Just the man to teach her to laugh again, eh? He wiped a bit of grease off his chin with the sleeve of his tunic. The Wyman doesn't go in making demands. It's really important to note his approach here. The way he handles this conversation, he's not forceful. He doesn't even seem terribly serious. It's like, oh, it's just polite dinner conversation, right? Offering to help out his widowed cousin, maybe giving her some comfort or sorting out a possible problem. Let us take care of this problem for you. That kind of thing, when really it's ambition. Brand admits in his own thoughts that he doesn't really care about marriage. So that uh, flies, you know, that works on Bran. We know Wyman is interested in Danelle Hornwood, not just because of his relation to her, but because of her lands that happen to lie on Manderley borders. Referring to the map, Hornwood, both the forest and the castle, lie east of the White Knife and Winterfell, north of White Harbor, and just south of the Sheep's Head Hills and the Dreadfort. Due to both distance and the river, they aren't of direct interest to Winterfell, but both the Boltons and Manderleys have had some interest throughout history. And history repeats itself right here. The problem began because the Lord of Hornwood, Halys, and his heir, Darren, were both killed while fighting for Rob during the first battles of the war. Hence the issue of the succession for the Hornwood lands in the first place and why Wyman is all of a sudden interested. But he's not the only one interested because House Hornwood is also connected to the Karstarks, the Flints, the Tallhearts. Uh, this is all through the female line. And not to mention Halley's bastard who's being fostered at Deepwood Mott by House Glover. But when Danella herself arrives at Bran's feast, it's House Bolton that's giving her trouble. Despite the manderly ambitions, he's doing it the right way. The Boltons, meanwhile, just show up and start being violent. Ramsay Snow, at this point, hasn't made any moves yet, but he's gathering men, and that can't be good. And Danella Hornwood turns out to be very right about that. Now, we can also assume that Wyman would know that the Boltons are going to make this move, and he might not just be acting out of pure ambition, but out of self-preservation and loyalty to the Starks. All these things can be in play. It doesn't have to be just one. The point being, no one wants the Hornwood lands to fall to the Boltons. It doesn't have to be ambition to keep a powerful tract of land out of a dangerous enemy's hands. It just, the two happen to go well together, because if you control it, well, then they can't. An interesting thought here, too, though, is that Ramsay... This is Clash of Kings. Ramsay isn't famous yet. He's not well known. The readers really don't know who he is for the most part. So we wonder how much White Harbor knew about him. They certainly knew of his existence, but did they know he was this bad? Did they know he was this cruel? Did they know exactly what they were dealing with? That he was a psychopath, basically? Probably not. But if they did, They'd really be worried about the timing of all this. They'd really know that this is a dangerous foe, and they would know that time is of the essence. I think, though, if they had known just how bad he was, Wyman would have been a little more pushy about it. He would have warned of this threat instead of trying to just, hey, maybe Danella Hornwood should marry Amanderly again. I think he would have been a little more aggressive. But we don't know. And Wyman was right, of course. Whether he knew how right he was, he was very right. Ramsay captured Danella as she made her way home from Winterfell. Here's some art of Wyman, Wendell, Willis, and Danella Hornwood by Sir Hartzelot on DeviantArt. But how sad is this for poor Danella? She loses her family, then comes to warn Winterfell of a man who proceeds to capture her. And he probably couldn't have even snatched her had she not left her castle. So, man, that's too bad. She went straight into a forced marriage. She was locked in a tower, infamously, and then supposedly starved to death. As we recall, she was found with blood around her mouth, and some of her fingers were bitten off. At the time, it was just a really lovely image to think of, and yeah. But we actually speculated that she chewed her fingers off, kind of like uh, Theon talks about doing in A Dance with Dragons. So... Because he says that the pain of a flayed finger is so bad that it's better to bite it off. 
And that seems like what really happened. So she was starving and keeping herself out of this excruciating pain. Not good anyway, you look at it. So Wyman does what he has to do here. He has to react to the situation turning a lot worse than maybe he could have predicted. We hear from Bren that Roderick has gone east to deal with this situation. Ramsey may have gotten the girl, but Wyman got the castle. Once he heard that this had happened, he sent his men to seize the castle. But Roderick was mad about that, even though he seemed to be doing the right thing. He didn't know it was the right thing is the problem. This is because Sir Roderick doesn't know anything about Ramsay at this point. Otherwise, clearly he doesn't know anything about him. He ended up trusting him. Of course, this nobody knew. Well, nobody in Winterfell knew. But the reason Roderick was angry with this is because it immediately kicked off violence between Manderly men and Dreadfort men. They're fighting each other in the Hornwood Forest. So, I don't know. Basically, what I'm saying is, had Roderick known better... He would have backed Wyman right away, even though Wyman might not have been acting entirely good faith. He's a much better uh, guy than Ramsey, clearly. While Wyman has gone back to White Harbor to build the defenses and warships he said he was going to build for Rob, he kept those under his control moving even while he himself remains still. He's obviously not one for moving around a lot, but he can issue orders and make moves by telling other people what to do. Remember, White Harbor has this huge pool of men to use. When Theon takes Winterfell for himself, Wyman commits yet more men to the Stark cause by sending them to join Sir Roderick in his attempt to take the castle back. He sent apparently three barges stuffed with knights, siege engines, and warhorses. The siege engines never got used. The warhorses, I suppose, did. But it, the point is, it was a large amount of men. This is after Rob has already sent and gone south. White Harbor still has this, and they still have even more. We know that this force was betrayed by Ramsay and the men were killed. But all of them? Maybe not all of them. That's a lot of men to kill. It was, I think, 600. So this might even end up having some significance in the winds of winter in terms of telling the real story of what happened there. Because most of the North still thinks that it was the Ironborn, that it was Theon that did this stuff to Winterfell. But White Harbor might know the truth. And they might be waiting for the right moment to spill it. They might not, though. They may just suspect it. Regardless, if there are survivors, you know what side they're going to be on. They're going to want to go against the Boltons. They're going to want revenge. So while we take note of Lord Wyman's ability to play nice with the Boltons and Lannisters early on, Notice that it was on display for the Starks as well. Not that he had a nefarious plan for Bran or Winterfell, but he was certainly on the lookout for opportunity. It's all in the game. Hm. It's only after he's kept up this act for so long, looking for what he wants, getting what he wants, which is the return of his son Willis, that Wyman finally drops the charade. He lets loose a bit, especially those words to the phrase we began the episode with, which is, one of the greatest burns in the entire series. I'm sure you agree. For all the great lords who talk about how weak Wyman Manderly is, though, only Hostein Frey actually bears steel against him, which is right after said epic burn. Though, more important, it's not the burn. It's the murder of Big Walder that got Sir Hostein so mad. The insult was kind of just salt in the wound. He thought he was getting revenge on Wyman because he thinks the Manderleys killed his cousin. We don't actually think this, though. We don't think Wyman had anything to do with Big Walder's death. Here's some art of Big Walder and uh, Wyman Manderly himself by Jibby Links on Devi DeviantArt. We think the killer was Little Walder, a dangerous and clever kid, at least clever enough to blame White Harbor men for his crime. Personally, the fact that he's covered in blood after finding his dead brother in the snow should have been frozen. That, to me, that's enough reason, but that's a whole other story. The point is, for now, that Sir Hostein and others were very willing to believe that story, that it was White Harbor men who did it. And Lord Wyman not only didn't argue, he just insulted them to kind of, I guess that would make them think he's confirming that it really was him. It's kind of like when uh, five different terrorist organizations all take credit for the same bombing. They're like, yeah, look how awesome we are. This is... Wyman, like, 
saying, blame us for killing him? Well, don't you mean credit us? And of course, they didn't actually do it. So in other words, his insult sealed the deal. Or walrus to the deal, you could say. And Hostein cut him for it. Badly, right? He cut through, it says, three of his four chins. And though we're given no indication that he died, it's a serious wound even for someone in good health, and Ward Wyman is not in good health. But, as we've also said, he seems fully prepared to die. He seems fully prepared to go, his plans are in motion, and his death might be part of seeing those plans through. And he knows his son's going to take over for him when the time comes. So let's do that. Let's look at his son and his family, the rest of them, who will surely play a larger role whenever he does pass on. If we're assuming that he does, then, well, the other Mandalies are going to come to the forefront. So time to look at them. A Game of Thrones, Catelyn 8, is the first time that we see a Manderly through someone's eyes in a chapter. It's both Sir Willis and Sir Wendell, with 1,500 men brought in support of King Rob. The W Team. A Game of Thrones. Catelyn 8. His boys were both older than Catelyn, and she might have wished that they did not take after their father quite so closely. So Willis was only a few eels short of not being able to mount his own horse. She pitied the poor animal. Sir Wendell, the younger boy, would have been the fattest man she'd ever known had she only neglected to meet his father and brother. Willis was quite informal, Wendell loud and boisterous. Both had ostentatious walrus moustaches and heads as bare as a baby's bottom. Neither seemed to own a single garment that was not spotted with food stains. Yet she liked them well enough. They had gotten her to rob, as their father had vowed, and nothing else mattered. So, Wyman, Willis, Wendell, Willis's daughters Winifred and Willa. Is there a pattern there? <laughs> their mother is Leona Woolfield, the Woolfields being vassals of the Manderleys, but they're not really a prominent house. Wendell isn't married. Just like Wyman, their appearances are almost cartoonishly described. Many compare their descriptions with the Mace Tyrell we ended up with on the show. Huge mustache, walrus mustache that is, large stomach, shiny head, fits the bill. But it is important to note what Catelyn adds on at the end. Maybe they do look comical, but like their father, they got the job done. Here's some more art. Wyman, Willis, Wendell, Willa, the W team in full display by Hubsher. Both brothers actually entered the story in A Game of Thrones, as we've just heard. They were seen before Lord Wyman. They were sent by their father to sort out the South. They did a good job of it, as much as they could. There's definitely some parallels here to this Sir Medric and Sir Torin that we saw during the Dance of the Dragons. Like their ancestors who accompanied Queen Rhaenyra, Wyman's sons accompanied Catelyn, and also Sir Roderick, and the Blackfish from White Harbor to Moat Kaelin. And not only did they bring those three, but 1,500 men made up of roughly 20 knights, 200 mounted riders, swordsmen, free riders, etc. Wyman being in charge. We also know the fateful agreement Rob ends up making with Walder Frey in order to use the twins, the bridge specifically, and that he also decides to split his army at that same point. Unfortunately, the Manderly brothers also part ways and like so many other siblings in the story, they're not going to meet again. Willis is under Roose Bolton's command at first. You know, obviously you can see why that wouldn't go well. Meanwhile, Wendell goes west with Rob towards River Run to free the army from Jamie's siege. The duo suffered pretty varied levels of success early on. Willis fights in the Battle of the Green Fork against the Lannisters and is part of the force that we now know was, over time, essentially sacrificed by Roos. When, when I told you about how he was being put in, in danger constantly, well, Roos was doing that with all the men that weren't his. He was trying to wipe them all out to clear out space for himself in the North later. Thinking ahead, he was. In this case, Willis kept surviving these dangerous jobs. So he sort of stymied Roos in that, but... He is a valuable hostage. That probably helped him survive. And he's also very identifiable, as we, just, as we pointed out. He's a very noticeable character. And everybody knows White Harbor is rich. But Wendell, who is still with Rob, had the honor of being part of Rob's personal guard during the Battle of Whispering Wood. And Rob survived, so good job Wendell and the guards, especially considering three of the other personal guard were slain by Jamie Lannister himself. 
Moving on to Clash of Kings, things stayed pretty comfy for Wendell, as comfy as you can be on campaign. He's chosen to escort Catelyn after Rob sends her south to treat with Renly Baratheon down farther south. During the voyage, Catelyn notes Wendell as being protective and that he highly values his honor. Not really surprising from a Northman and a knight and a son of Wyman Manderly, it's pretty evident in the text that Wendell is just a decent guy and doing a serious job of the task he's been given, which is protecting Catelyn. Meanwhile, Willis not having a good time at all. He's sent to Harrenhal. Okay, Roose Bolton and Harrenhal, you can see <laughs> nothing good here. He's captured, sent to Harrenhal, Arya turns up, and, well, to be fair, twice the Lannisters offer Willis to Wyman in potential hostage swaps. Or just regular trades, not necessarily hostage swaps. First, Tywin offers his safe return if Wyman abandons Rob's cause. Wyman refuses that. Later, Tyrion replies to Rob's peace terms by offering to trade Willis and Harry and Karstark for Willem Lannister. Well, that might have actually worked. It might have actually happened. But then, well, Rickard Karstark did his thing and killed poor Willem in captivity. So that trade never happened. But up in the north, Wyman still seemed pretty confident about Willis's chances, even though he's in all these tough spots. He casually mentions to Bran that Willis doesn't want to sit out the war as a prisoner. He's an active, honorable guy, brave guy. He wants to be in the action. Well, Wyman is being subtle here about wanting to get his son back, but he's also putting in the good word. Really, it's a lot worse. If Wyman knew the full extent of it, he would probably push harder to get his son back. He didn't know how bad it was. While at Harrenhal, Willis and his fellow prisoners are kept at the Tower of Dread. Okay, so Roose Bolton, the Mountain, Harrenhal, Vargo Hote, Tower of Dread. Whew. Yeah, pretty bad. But he is apparently given some freedom of the castle after pledging not to escape. Naturally, Willis uses this to search the kitchens, who can blame him? But eventually, after that, more eventually, we can say, Roose Bolton takes Harrenhal, and Willis is liberated, air quotes, big time. <laughs> He's not really liberated, and the rough times are far from over. It only seems like something good is about to happen for him, but no. The two brothers come very, very close to seeing each other in Storm of Swords at the Red Wedding, because Wendell is stuck close to Rob this entire time, and even offered to also take a fray bride in order to make matters easier for his king while dealing with the prickly Walder and the, you know, I'm not marrying your daughter after all business with Jane Westerling. And Wendell is also put in charge of the baggage train. Surely there's a joke we can make about Wendell and watching over the food, but yeah, we'll just say that and move on. Willis, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, I don't know which of these is worse. Probably Wendell's spot, but it's it's not easy to pick. He never makes it to the wedding. While Roos and his army are crossing the Trident at the Ruby Ford, the river is so high, it's basically impassable, and Roos has to settle for ferrying his men across in small groups. In the middle of this, Gregor Clegane shows up again, and Willis is in charge of the rear guard. Which Roos was probably aware would happen, or at least wanted it to happen. So he's driven back into the river with his men. Most drown or are ridden down, killed in some various ways, some awful way. But Willis is captured again. Roos later tells Catelyn that Willis tried to rally his men as best as he could, but was driven in the river by Gregor Clegane. This very unlucky Sir Willis is held captive at Harrenhal again. Which, again, while that's really awful, it did at least mean he missed the Red Wedding. And Roos wanted them to miss the Red Wedding. That's part of the point. To thin out the men as soon as much as possible to make it all easier to kill them at the Red Wedding. Now, just as certain men were being taken captive during the Red Wedding to ensure their family's loyalties, others were not needed for such leverage and were thus expendable. A storm of swords. Catelyn, seven. Rob! she screamed. She saw small John Umber wrestle a table off its trestles. Crossbow bolts thudded into the wood. One, two, three, as he flung it down on top of his king. 
Robin Flint was ringed by frays, their daggers rising and falling. Sir Wendell Manderley rose ponderously to his feet, holding his leg of lamb. A quarrel went in his open mouth and came out the back of his neck. Sir Wendell crashed forward, knocking the table off its trestles and sending cups, flagons, trenches, platters, turnips, beets, and wine bouncing, spilling, and sliding across the floor. And this is where tragic irony comes up again, because had Willis died in one of those many attempts that Roos kind of set him up for, Wendell would probably not have been killed at the Red Wedding. They would have taken him hostage instead. The fact that they already had a manually hostage meant they didn't need Wendell, so... That's that for him. With Wendell dead and Willis captured, it was time for Wyman to adopt his play nice and wait for an opportunity role. That role gave us all some consternation as many of us were fooled by it at first. We didn't know at first he was playing a game. We didn't really know Wyman Manderley that well. We hadn't had the North Remember speech. And we hear of Davos being executed and White Harbor siding with the Lannisters. It never felt right that Davos would be killed off screen. And later we did have it confirmed that he wasn't. We learned not only that was Lord Wyman acting, but many in his family were in on it too, particularly Winifred, but not Willa. Willa was just awesome on her own. The Manderley women are important not only for this, but because we expect Lord Wyman to pass soon enough, and when it does, Willis becomes Lord Willis, and Leona Woolfield becomes the Lady of White Harbor and Winifred would become the heir. Speaking of Winifred, here's some art by Elua Cinnamon. Little Brave Willa would then, in turn, be Winifred's heir. And here's more art, also by Elua Cinnamon. She is really popular in general, Willa, that is, in terms of fan art and in cosplay. We also have the Three Hairs art of Willa, and Elia Doodles on Tumblr also did Willa. You can see there's just so much art of Willa. She's a great popular character, and I don't really need to tell you why. You know why. But aside from all that awesome art, if either of those two became heir to White Harbor, it might get interesting, because neither of them are married. Hmm. Those both were betrothed until recently, though. This is also a little interesting side bit that kind of gets forgotten. Willa was set to marry Little Walder, but as we know, Little Walder is now dead. This is one of the reasons why Wyman is being blamed for the death of the phrase, because, well, he has a lot of incentive to, and people know why. Let me explain. We know that given Wyman's insults, it's easy to see why the phrase would blame him for that death, but also because of the three missing phrase that never made it to Winterfell. One of those was set to be Winifred's husband. So... Very close together, both of the Freys who were going to marry Amanderly vanished or and or died. Well, they both died. One of them, no one saw the result of. They just ate him. So that's suspicious to anyone who thinks about it. Just both of these marriages broken like that with deaths? Hmm. But this also isn't just getting free of the Frey marriages that he never wanted in the first place. He might be thinking of his own son's safety. Think about this. We already don't think Willis has a great chance of surviving either, but we'll get to that later. He would have had a worse chance of surviving if these Frey marriages weren't broken. Why? Well, think about what happens. You got a Frey married to the heir of White Harbor and a Frey married to that heir's heir in White Harbor. All they got to do is kill Willis and all of a sudden, they're ruling through a young woman, you know? And of course, in a Westerosi society, they could use violence, you know, spousal abuse, things like that, to keep this wife in, sort of, in line, make her do what they want, and effectively rule White Harbor through them. No way did Lord Wyman not see that coming as a possibility. There's no way he missed that as an angle for the phrase to take. So he knew that this had to be taken care of quickly before they made their move. Because if they take out Willis, it's too late. So we should not be surprised at all that Lord Wyman broke these marriages. The way he did it, though, the method, and the way the method played out. Okay, that was a surprise. A Feast of Phrase. George made us readers wait about 10 whole chapters before Davos appeared after the cliffhanger fake-out by Lord Wyman. Alive, but 
in a jail cell and not in on the ploy. Nor were we readers, at first, in on the ploy. Though, we got in the loop pretty soon after. We're even led to believe, though, before this, that we're seeing him in his final moments. Almost like we did with Ned in the Black Cells. After all, we know what's happening. We heard the report in Cersei's chapter, so we're like, oh man, this is, is, are we about to see his death scene? But then Robert Glover appears at Davos's cell door. And Robert, we've got to talk about him for just a sec. He's one of the two Glover brothers who were part of Rob's original force. Robert, after being freed from captivity and returning to the North, he was with Willis for a lot of this. He was captured in some of the same engagements. He came to White Harbor to try to raise men, but Davos had heard he was unsuccessful. But that might be a lie. At the end of the chapter, he also confirms that he agrees with his granddaughter about being loyal to the Starks. He knows via Theon's old squire Wex Pike that Ramsay sacked Winterfell, not Theon. Again, we, we wonder about other White Harbor men that may have survived, but he heard it from Wex. More importantly about Wex, or just as importantly, he knows about a surviving Stark. And this is where Wyman's reputation as a master game player is really confirmed. It's really kind of similar to what Doran Martell is doing in the South in the previous book, revealing his plans to Arianne and us readers when we thought it was something else. We were led along to think this guy's playing passive, and all of a sudden, fire and blood is what Doran says, and Wyman Manus is the North remembers. Pretty uh, good parallels there. Lord Wyman knows the details. He knows what's happening. He keeps an eye on them. Uh, for example, he knows his maester. He has a relationship to the Lannisters, because he's from Lannisport. And he was born as a Lannister of Lannisport. And thinking of the little details like making sure to shorten the fingers on the fake Davos' corpse. And also being honest with Davos that if his ruse had failed, sorry Davos, would have had you killed, would have had to play along. I mean, this is my family we're talking about. But at least he's honest about that. And he's also aware, of course, of the phrase and Ramsay's horrible crimes. He's able to act on all this himself and do what needs to be done. And it does. He's successful. He has a weaker hand, yet he plays it really well. He's able to get what he wants despite not having a lot of leverage. And what he wants is Wendell's bones returned and more importantly, Willis coming home after that awful ordeal. And, well, Willis's ordeal, I think, is a big thing, and I don't think we should forget about it. So let's have a reminder, as awful as it is, going back to Feast for Crows here and Jamie's point of view, which shows us Willis's more than understandable reaction to the news that he's getting to go home. Jamie three, a Feast for Crows. The other captives had been better treated, Sir Willis was among them, along with several other highborn Northmen, taken prisoner by the mountain that rides in the fighting at the fords of the Trident. Useful hostages, all worth a goodly ransom. They were ragged, filthy, and shaggy to a man, and some had fresh bruises, cracked teeth, and missing fingers, but their wounds had been washed and bandaged, and none of them had gone hungry. Jamie wondered if they had any inkling what they'd been eating and decided it was better not to inquire. None had any defiance left, especially not Sir Willis, a bushy-faced tub of suet with dull eyes and sallow, sagging jowls. When Jamie told him he would be escorted to Maidenpool, and there put on a ship for White Harbour, Sir Willis collapsed into a puddle on the floor, and sobbed longer and louder than Pierre had. It took four men to lift him back onto his feet, too much roast goat, Jamie reflected. Gods, but I hate this bloody castle. Harren Hall had seen more horror in its three hundred years than Casterly Rock had witnessed in three thousand. So now that Wyman has achieved his goal, at least that important short-term goal of getting his family safe again, getting his leverage back, now he's ready to move on to the next phase in his plan. It's no longer Mr. Nice Merling. In order to secure the North's loyalty, Roos has conspired to marry Ramsay to, you know, fake Arya, Jane Poole, as we know. In order to have this marriage viewed by as many Northern lords as possible, of course, he invites the whole North. And Wyman comes, with a small force of White Harbor men, 
They come to Winterfell and with their fray friends who, you know, mysteriously vanish on the way. But, of course, he's careful with this. Another piece of being very attentive to the details. Wyman gives the three Freys palfreys. Paul Freys? No, that's not a joke. Perhaps it's a sign of good faith and friendship. No, it's not a sign of good faith and friendship. It's covering his butt in terms of the old gods. Guest right is huge in the North, as we know. I don't need to explain that to y'all. But the detail of guest right is important here, which is that guest right ends upon the giving of guest gifts. And that is why Wyman was within his so-called rights to dispose of the phrase, despite them having been guests so recently. Now here's an unusual piece of fan art, not a normal piece of art, but a Wyman Manderly Funko with pie by Jenny Slife. Nice job, Jenny. That's a cool one. Of course, this business with Wyman Manderly and the disappearing phrase, that has nothing to do with each other. Wyman travels by his litter. He had nothing to do with those phrases disappearing. He wasn't with them. Hmm. Yeah, no one believes that. Just as no one believes that Arya is really Arya, but they have to play along. You know, a lot of people know that lies are being told to people's faces, but that's the problem with someone telling you a lie to your face while brandishing a bigger sword than you have. You either go along with that lie or that you get that sword instead of that lie. What are you going to do? Soon comes the feast, which people assume is Wyman's natural arena. It's noted that Manderly brings lots of food for the snow-starved Winterfell crew, but no hostages. Lord Bolton notices this and is careful with what he eats. He's wary of Lord Wyman. He's worried about poison. He also notices that the average age of the men that Lord Wyman brings is sort of on the, shall we say, grayer side. That is meaningful, very meaningful, because we know what old men do in the North when they think it's their time. That is someone you don't want to face ever, a Northerner who thinks it's his time to die. That's a tough foe to beat. It's hard to beat someone that's willing to die. But the Boltons and the rest do need food. It's not just a game here. So the Manderleys can't be accused of not being generous, of not doing their part, at least not openly. But he's also not daring to risk his family again. He left them all behind. This generosity is actually more of this whole lawyer detail, guest right contract reading. Because he's eating his own food, not... The food offered by his Bolton hosts. Guest right doesn't necessarily apply. And some might argue, you know, like an old god district attorney, if there were such a thing, you might argue that there was no guest right anyway because Winterfell isn't truly House Bolton's to play host with. So Lord Wyman may have covered all the curse bases well here. It's good to be sure when you're dealing with curses and the old gods. At the feast, Wyman stops playing. <laughs> the mummer's farce is kind of over at this point. It's like a complete opposite of his attitude from before. It almost reads like he's been bursting to do this. Like he can't wait to finally stop playing nice and get to just call out people and laugh at them and just laugh at his own impending death, which just shows how tough he is. Um, it just really gives the lie to people judging him by his appearance. He can barely contain his hatred for the phrase which he's helped, held back so long. First off, he calls on Abel, the singer, whom we know is Mance. He might know it's Mance, by the way. That's a whole other story. But in his jolly way, he calls for it, like he was with Bran back in Clash, to sing of the rat cook. <laughs> How unsubtle is that? Just, hey, give us the rat cook song. <laughs> Just in the, media, in the middle of a feast. Who would want to hear that song in a feast? That's not a happy song for feasting and drinking and dancing. So it's yet another of many reasons to think that he doesn't expect to survive this mission he's on. He goes from marrying Freys to his family and playing nice with them to openly insulting and threatening them when he's outnumbered. Like, it's, it's one thing... When he's in White Harbor with the fray surrounded by his own men and he has to play nice because of his son and all these other things. But when he goes to Winterfell with a small group of old men, 
all of a sudden, all bets are off. He's insulting people to their faces, laughing at them, making pointed barbs, things like that. Total turnaround. The rat cook is an important point here as well, because as many of the legendary stories go in A Song of Ice and Fire, it's referencing far more than just itself. It's not just an aside for world building. It's relevant to the current story as well. So let's review it real quickly and see what Wyman might be doing. Well, quick reminder, the legend is of a cook at the night fort who killed the son of a king who did him some unknown wrong. Doesn't really matter. He served this king that a pie made from that son, that prince, I suppose you'd say, and the gods, in their anger, of course, turned the cook into a giant rat who was doomed to eat nothing but his son. But the really important key point is how the old gods felt about it. It's not what someone might think. Old Nan tells us the story. A storm of swords. Bran, four. It was not for murder that the gods cursed him, old Nan said, nor for serving the Andal king his son in a pie. A man has a right to vengeance, but he slew a guest beneath his roof, and that the gods cannot forgive. So considering the feast here, this is Winterfell, the heart of the north, more than a few of the guests are going to catch that reference. They're going to know, probably all of them are going to catch that reference, except maybe the Freys themselves, who are from the south and don't necessarily know the Rat Cook story. So they might not be in on the joke. Not long after the song, the pies are actually delivered, and we have our Feast of Phrase. In what appears to be more borrowing from the Rat Cook tale, which is he's mentioning just before, we have the three pies get served, one for each fray, apparently. The first slices, as is customary, go to the most honored folks there, which would be Roose Bolton and his wife, and the next slices go to the Freys. And then Wyman himself gets served and ends up going through six pieces and really enjoys it. Two slices from each pie. Never has cannibalism tasted so good. Now, it's pretty much a given that these are fray pies. There's really not any pushback in the fandom against this theory. It seems very straightforward. But there is some details that maybe get lost in the shuffle that I think make this interesting. The three frays, Simon, Rhaegar, and Jared are the ones baked into the pies. But there's the experience of Willis to mention here. In Jamie's point of view, as we saw from that quote, Willis was forced to eat parts of Vargo Hote. Maybe this was kind of where they got the idea to make someone else be a cannibal, force this on the phrase since it was forced on his son. It's kind of ironic either way that Wyman uses the tale of the rat cook, which is basically a, a morality play about the importance of guest right to take revenge on those who broke it, right? Now, <laughs> very, very juicy. Of course, Wyman is deeply enraged by the murder of his son, obviously, but on the whole, the Northerners, if you are to believe the tale, which I do, I see no reason to doubt it, they see breaking guest right as something far worse than murder. It's as bad as it gets. Guest right and kin slaying are one and two, neck and neck for the worst things. Murder is a little farther down the list. After the pies is when Wyman starts to relax, get drunk, ask for the song, and that might be a little confusing. If all his plans are just now coming to fruition, doesn't it seem like he's kind of risking it by just being openly insulting? Why doesn't he keep playing along? Why doesn't he keep the act going? Well, on some level, it's just Northern attitude. Even though Wyman's part Southern, this is a very much Northern thing, which is the inevitability of death, the inevitability of winter, the fact that you're going to go, you're going to die one day, may as well be on your own terms. It's a very Viking thing. It's a very big part of Viking culture. And this, I think, is something that George has borrowed and, and put, used really well here. I like it a lot. It's a great warrior culture thing to have. Vikings made a big deal out of having a good death. You know, a lot of Viking literature, the songs, the epics are loaded with stories of epic deaths, last stands, things like that. Well, this is Wyman's last stand. But 
the way they handle last stands is so interesting. It's if you know it's a last stand, you face it bravely. That's the whole part. Laughing at your own death, showing that courage till the last second. So that's what he's doing. He's just going out the way he wants, and this is his swan song, Merling song. Now, I won't say the South doesn't have warriors who face death just as bravely as those in the North, but not all deaths come from battle in general, especially not in the North where they face other dangers. And I'm not even talking about the walkers. I'm just talking about regular winter. John 10, A Dance with Dragons. It was a tale that any North men knew well. My father's grandmother was a flint of the mountains, on his mother's side, John told her. The first flints, they call themselves. They say the other flints are the blood of younger sons, who had to leave the mountains to find food and land and wives. It has always been a harsh life up there. When the snows fall and food grows scarce, their young must travel to the winter town, or take service at one castle or the other. The old men gather up what strength remains in them, and announce that they are going hunting. Some are found come spring. More are never seen again. So there you go. Life in the North is difficult. That's underselling it. The South doesn't have to worry about that. They don't have to worry about starvation. They don't have to worry about freezing to death. I mean, maybe they will soon if the walkers get that far south. But it's not a traditional thing for them to worry about. Whereas it's been a part of Northern culture and tradition for as long as there have been language and culture in the North at all. And, you know, speaking on how difficult life is in the north, it's even more difficult in the mountains than it is down at White Harbor. But still, Wyman's being a true northerner here. Three cheers for that. Let's talk about that and why he doesn't have an exit plan. Well, it's not a good situation for anyone here. Winter is coming with the temperature dropping, snow falling everywhere. That means uh, starving or being left out to exposure, all these things. Wyman brought plenty of food with him, but it's still finite. You know, that's still going to run out at some point. And the castle they're staying in, Winterfell, of course, is only half restored and over-occupied. Not to mention who's actually in the castle at this point. As food dwindles, snow falls, everything gets a little tighter... So does things inside Winterfell. The Bolton faction starts to show some cracks, which isn't surprising given what that foundation was built on. To make it all worse, there's random murders, there's the little brawls, there's the phrase getting more and more suspicious of Lord Wyman, and that eventually spills over, as we saw at the beginning, and people start fighting openly. Wyman's knights protect him, but the damage is done, there's no more pretense. These guys are now openly fighting. Roos's allies are fighting each other, which is not going to be helpful when Stannis comes. So he says, all right, well, we wanted to wait out Stannis, but instead we can't keep waiting because these guys are going at each other. So it's time to send them out to face Stannis directly. But still, why is Wyman risking his own life here? We haven't answered that question. Well, you could say he's achieved his goals, or at least set them in motion. Willis is back. White Harbor is safe, at least for now. Safe from the Boltons and Freys, I would think. And don't forget all the hidden ships he has and stashed money, so that helps with that. And the Freys are now in this terrible predicament, and he might have Rick and Stark coming to claim the throne. It might all be coming together for, well, not him, his family. Coming together for his plans. So if sacrificing himself and or a few hundred of his men, who he's not with, remember he stayed back at Winterfell because of his wound, if, if that gets the job done, that's a good death for him. That's the best he can hope for because he can't really go out fighting, right? He can't, he can't really fight. And also, as we've said several times, he doesn't even think his own life is worth that much. Not because he's not an important man, but because he thinks his health is going anyway. He's already on death's door. So... Again, go out fighting. Go out doing something rather than sitting there waiting for death to take you. That's not to say that they're definitely going to die, Wyman and the White Harbor men, 
Any number of different things could happen in the Battle of Ice, but again, we covered all that. So if you want to go through those possibilities, go back to our Battle of Ice series and check that out. But let's talk about the plans Wyman has set in motion for afterwards, after the battle, and after, meaning his support for House Stark, as well as something really important that he hasn't planned for at all. A Time for Wolves. A Time for Wolves was originally Martin's planned name for the final book in the series, but it seems that he changed his mind to A Dream of Spring, which he considered less spoilery. Hopefully, there's still a lot of time for wolves in that book. From Wyman's perspective, Davos is as well, and quite a few others, those few who know he's alive, that is, Rickon is believed to be the only viable Stark to place in Winterfell, thus restoring House Stark and righting a lot of wrongs. But to think that that's all in Wyman's mind, it means you haven't been listening. He's an ambitious man, a shrewd man, and as we've said, he is a master of combining ambition with opportunity. Filling a need for someone else to his own benefit. You know, profiting from being honorable. It's a good two-way approach. Wyman, again, loud and obvious in his attempts to support Rob, courteous and jovial to Bran, and he may well save Rickon and make him Warden of the North. Or King, perhaps. Who knows yet? We'll see. Or his family will make him King. We don't know yet. But he's going to want a reward for whatever service he does for the Starks. And he's going to deserve it, probably, given how well he's done to this point. If he survives at all, of course. Which he probably won't, but his family would get that benefit. That's how it tends to work. And here's one way that could happen immediately. Wyman does have... His two granddaughters, and one of them is close enough in age to Rickon to maybe marry him. How about that? Will a Rickon marriage? That'd be pretty cool. That's some, that's some, that would be, I wouldn't call it fan service, but it would make us fans happy. And uh, whoever marries Rickon, whether it's Willa or somebody else, you'd think they'd want that to happen soon because, you know, it shores up that alliance. Those marriages are important. It gets somebody in line with you. In, so in Wyman's mind, he may have left this kind of legacy idea of marrying into Winterfell or kind of co-ruling the North. Because again, if they marry Rickon, and he's thinking ahead, well, Rickon's a little boy. So his family might kind of de facto be in charge. And he's almost certainly aware of that. And even if it doesn't go that far, House Manity would still be in really good standing for all this good service and all this loyalty, you know, even when things are going badly. And we've already said this, too, and it's time to explore it a little more. The Manderleys are more represented in the story than one would think. We meet Wyman, his two sons, daughter-in-law, two granddaughters, and a cousin. That's Sir Marlon. We see all these characters on page, which isn't normal. We haven't seen that for any of the other families, except for the Starks, of course. The closest things, we see a few Mormons, we see several Car Starks, but they're just mostly kind of there for a minute and not you know, in their home environment. They're in battle. They're at war. All this stuff. It's, it's different. They're not really a family either. These are kind of presented as, it's like almost like a faction where the Manderleys are more fleshed out. They're more three-dimensional. Now let's look at some other stuff. Here's a couple of points. As we've seen through the travels of the brothers in the Riverlands to Wyman's entrance into Dance with Dragons, the Manderleys have been constant. They've been throughout the whole story. Even if their name is barely mentioned, even if they are background players, they've always been a part of it. They've always been important. And we this is a reason we love the series so much. George has put these characters in. They were small for a while. They're background. They were doing important things, but they weren't that important. But now all of a sudden, they come out, they act, and they're big. They're not a king. They're not riding dragons. They're not doing anything like that. But they're really important, and it doesn't feel like they came out of nowhere, even though they didn't do a whole lot before. In retrospect, their, their contributions early in the series seem a lot larger because we focused on them. And the Mandalas are a perfect example of how war affects all people in one way or another. Which brings up this other point. We do see all those other families, but we mostly only see their men. And that's the big difference between seeing them in their home environment versus like a battle environment. Because we only see... Not always, but mostly only see the men when we're looking at the wars. Of course, the Mormons and some others have there's exceptions. But this is why we don't see them as whole families. Because, well, they're split up because half of them are at home and the other half are at war. 
The Boltons, I suppose we see some of their family life, but they're just dysfunctional, and they're also really small. <laughs> so the Manderleys are our closest parallel to the Starks, I suppose. Loving, loyal, family-centered. It's, it's a healthy thing to uh, emulate. And, well, they, they may be strangers to the North, in ancient terms, that is, but they bleed ice as much as any other family in the region over the th last thousand years or so. And they certainly seem to support the direwolf. That's been very straightforward. Proudly and fiercely, maybe for another thousand years. Maybe a thousand years from now, they'll be able to say, a thousand years ago, Lord Wyman did his thing. And it made House Manderley even more famous and ensured their good standing for many years to come. But there's more to this. This gets more complicated because... Well, what about John and Rob's will? Rick and, and John, how is that going to play out? Well, with that, you also have to throw in the conundrum of what John's going to do after he comes back from death. And how does that play into his Night's Watch vow? And then fake Arya and the bolts. Like, there's so many things that are happening at once. There's a lot of moving parts. It's too, it's too much to predict them. All we can do is make sure we are aware of them all and get them all straight so that when they do happen, it's not confusing. We have a great handle on it. But still, bottom line, I don't think John would ever go, go to war against Rickon or really vice versa. I don't think Wyman would, you know, push Rickon to go to war against John. But something's got to go, something's got to give here, and Lord Wyman might die before learning of Rob's will, which would mean that Wyman's plans are carried by somebody else, like his son or one of his granddaughters, and they might have a totally different attitude about Jon Snow. Because, well, by that point, he might be some strange, undead bastard guy, you know, that people might not like so much. Maybe he's more wolf-like. It's just, there's a lot of things that could really happen that throw this all into chaos. And so that makes it a great question. It makes it a really fun thing to look at, and it really gets me excited for the winds of winter even more than I already am. But we'll keep waiting, we'll be patient, and we'll enjoy that resolution together someday and talk about it when it happens. Ice and fire and Merlings. I don't need to tell you all that there are a lot of reasons why A Song of Ice and Fire history is great. Of course, I'm a, one of the biggest fans of it there is. But I'll give you a little backstory on myself and part of why I love it so much. At the time I read the series, circa 2000, 2001, I was also a big fan of the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan. I picked up A Song of Ice and Fire in part because it was recommended by the same friend. He had some credibility for recommending something that I liked. Never mind that the Wheel of Time series went downhill a bit. I still finished it and still liked it, but at the time, it was still pretty early on. One of the main themes of the Wheel of Time series is, as the name implies, that history repeats itself. So I was really keyed into that concept because the Wheel of Time just really makes a big deal out of that and does it really well. In A Song of Ice and Fire, and Wheel of Time to be fair, history doesn't literally repeat itself. The high points are similar, but the details are fascinatingly unique. That's why seeing different versions of similar events is really cool. So here, we're going to keep to the high points and not worry about the details too much, though we're going to mention some details, but it's also going to mean going to some dark places. Let's think again of when a harsh winter threatens and when food may not be sufficient. And the quote that told us of how elder men declare they are going out to hunt despite everyone knowing there is no game to be found. It's a brave, tragic, and honorable way to die, but it doesn't always follow this exact pattern. The point isn't to freeze to death. The point is to have one less mouth to feed and to face death bravely. It's a noble sacrifice that his family will know happened. And they will remember because, well, the North does that. Remember, after all. But along with that long memory, it can get nasty. Almost as nasty as my puns. The North dismembers. Among other things, lost in the fist-pumping awesomeness and talk of curses of the Frey Pies is the awkward truth that Lord Wyman made unwitting cannibals of quite a few innocent people. Right? Lord Manderley wasn't there because he wanted to be. He was there kind of because he had to be and because he had plans of revenge. Well, setting aside the ethics here, or... Well, wait, maybe 
that's part of the argument that the more dire a situation, the more secondary ethics have to be sacrificed in order to maintain core ethics. Would you eat a fray to stop the Boltons from taking the North? Many would, perhaps most, perhaps nearly all. But eating the phrase here wasn't necessary. It was just kind of a coup de gras. Killing them was the part that mattered. The, the eating part, that, that's, I don't know. Why not just burn their bodies after killing them? Well, for one thing, that wouldn't be as fun. It wouldn't be as cool of a story. But it does suggest something that I'm going to call the beginnings of a pattern, if not an already developed pattern. One might notice that there is a lot of cannibalism in A Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons. The North dismembers, all right, like a butcher. Let me lay some of this out for you. There's the Frey Pies, of course. That's been explained. We have Bran eating dead Night's Watchman flesh. Cold Hands tells him it's pork. Arya also is told that she's eating pork when she looks at her flesh funny and is like, wait, what am I eating here? That one, there's a good chance that one really is pork. But that's just one example. And, you know, even if that one does turn out to be human, not hum not be human flesh, well, there's, there's lots more. Jojen paste, anyone? That theory has a lot of merit to it. Then there's Skagos. The idea that Davos is going there to see more of Skagos, so it won't just be rumor. We'll actually see it firsthand. And most notably, we have a very famous scene in The Dance with Dragons where Stannis' men are burned at the stake for eating one of their dead fellow soldiers. Here's the thing, and it's creepy and scary. All this eating of human flesh, mm, it's just a taste. Ah, sorry. A taste of what's to come. What I mean is that a good half of the cannibalism stories are directly related to deprivation and desperation. They aren't eating human flesh because they like it so much as because they have no other choice. Again, Stannis' men are a perfect example. They didn't have anything else to eat. Think about that for one second and ask yourself this. At what point is this situation going to get better? When is there going to be more food for these northerners? Uh, is the winter just going to improve all of a sudden? I think we can all agree that everything seems to be trending the other way. Towards starvation, towards more winter, towards more darkness. What's the name of the next book again? Basically, we haven't seen anything yet. This, the lack of food is going to become more than just desperate. It's going to become epidemic. Not to mention the implications for the actual armies of the dead and their leaders. You better eat your dead friend or child or it might wake up with blue eyes and take a few bites off of you. So its boss can recruit you also. <laughs> However it happens, though, whether it's a trick, a total collapse of the wall, however they get around the wall or break it, I think we can assume that it will happen. The others will get to the north, they will enter the realms of men, and stuff is going to happen, and it won't be pretty. The Night's Watch, then the Umbers, and then south from there, maybe spreading out to the coasts. The March of the Others and the Armies of the Dead will be terrible and fascinating all at once. Winterfell is an obvious place for much of the North to flee. We all have, well, most of us have a, the idea that there's going to be some sort of show down there, a siege, maybe. And this is not new for people and winter. The difference is the presence of the White Walkers, but winter is a time when people flee to Winterfell to go to the Winter Town, which is a traditional hideout just outside the castle. It's a small enclosure, not small, but tightly packed so a lot of people can live there and uh, ride out the cold months or years. But it's built to handle winter, as in snow and cold. It has no walls, no real defenses, certainly nothing meant to stop an army of the dead. It's perfectly cromulent for outlasting that long winter, but you can't outlast the White Walkers. So many might try to flee inside the embiggened triple walls of Winterfell, but even that might not be enough. Not to mention the secret ways and deep crypts on the inside of Winterfell that others might use to get in. And even with those dangers set aside, clearly the castle has limits. No need to tempt additional cannibalism after all. I've shown how bad it's going to be already. Whew. Castles don't do much against dragons, and I have a sinking feeling they won't be so great against the others either. 
Although they probably will be a little slower than dragons. Dragons are at least fast. If the entirety of Winterfell is buried under a massive deluge of snow and ice, especially considering any unnatural cold, they can add to the frosty mix here. Well, Sansa's Castle of Snow may be more prophetic than we first thought. It might have multiple meanings too. If Winterfell is entirely coated in snow, I'm gonna think of her castle. And what happens when the others overrun a castle? Sadly, we probably will see that at Winterfell, as painful as it will be to imagine. I mean, other than that, uh, what are we supposed to believe? That they're defeated? That far north? Really? The others only get that far? I mean, it's possible, but I kind of doubt it. I think they're going to go a lot farther south. I think they have to have some major victories, or else wouldn't that be kind of weak? If, if they're just beaten that quickly? What kind of a foe would they be if they if we've been building up for all these books and then they're just stopped at Winterfell? Yeah, I, I just don't think so. I think they will go many places and the North is going to feel the brunt of it. Again, we have Danny seeing a vision of herself fighting an army of ice at the Trident. So I'm operating under the sad assumption that they're at least going to get that far south, which is, you know, well past the entirety of the North and the Vale while we're at it. So, the extension of that is the North is in really big trouble. The ones who flee to Winterfell may be doomed anyway. And the ones who don't may flee to our subject, White Harbor. And they may be just as doomed, but a little bit later. So the potential here is enormous and very epic to consider. So let's do that. As we wrap this episode up, we might be discussing the end of White Harbor itself. White Harbor Walkers. So, White Harbor is a place that clearly has food and walls, with a heck of a lot more space than Winterfell and the Winter Town. Not to mention it being a lot farther south. When Davos arrives there, though, he's already seeing refugees fill the city. And that's another example of something we've only barely scratched the surface on, and all these things work together. What do I mean? Well, more people means the food will go faster, as will sources of heat. Less wood to burn, less lamp oil. Then, what's happened in Stannis' army will probably happen in White Harbor too. Many will flee by ship, I suppose, but not everyone can do that. Not nearly everyone can do that. Probably fewer than we think. Ships aren't going to keep coming back there once word gets out of how terrible it is. I, you know, maybe they're bringing supplies, but you're not going to have a bunch of, I don't know, relief ships coming to, to save the commoners. That's not really a my priority for the Lords of Westeros. Maybe it'll become one because we know what happens when commoners die facing the White Walkers. They just become soldiers for the dead. It surely won't help to have more mouths around in any case, whatever, however this plays out. Given our previous thoughts on Winterfell, Danny at the Trident, the others are almost certainly coming to White Harbor. You can see why I'm just harping away on this. It just seems so inevitable when I lay it all out like this. You can even see why they'd want to come there. It's a target. It's like a giant recruitment center. And the living might be too starved and cold to put up much of a fight. And they'll be afraid. Fear, fueled by all these other deprivations, will transcend it all. The prayers will come in great multitudes to any god that will listen. But who would mistake the White Walkers as anything but a product of the old gods of the North? This is... Something else that I think is really possible. Might this desperation lead to religious extremism? Well, it's certainly something people get snippy over when things are going badly in the first place. A dance with dragons. The sacrifice. You Northmen brought these snows upon us, insisted Corley's Penny. You and your demon trees. Relaw will save us. Relaw will doom us, said Artos Flint. A pox on both your gods. Thought Asha Greyjoy. And the name of the chapter describes what's happening here. It's the sacrifice. It's sold as punishment for cannibalism, but it's also explicitly called a sacrifice, including by Melisandre herself. The point of the sacrifice is, of course, to break or at least loosen winter's grip. So keep that concept in mind. A sacrifice to hold back winter. So consider all that on a larger scale. All the elements are there. You got fear, desperation, starvation. Northern and Southern beliefs clashing. 
It's a lot. The burning of Stannis' men foreshadows many things. I don't think that's nearly the first time we're going to see something like that. In White Harbor, though, it would play out very differently because the religion is different there. Let me show you an example, also from the burning scene, that shows this sentiment pretty perfectly. It shows how the North feels, and it is probably how they would do it themselves if Stannis and Melisandre weren't calling the shots here, if they weren't guiding it. Even in this place of fear and darkness, the Lord of Light protects us. Sir Godfrey Faring told the men who gathered to watch as the stakes were hammered down into the holes. What is your Southern god to do with snow? demanded Artos Flint. His black beard was crusted with ice. This is the wrath of the old gods come upon us. It is them we should appease. Aye, said Big Bucket Wall. Red Ralu means nothing here. You will only make the old gods angry. Okay, whoa. Artos Flint thinks an offering should be made to the old gods, and Big Bucket Wall thinks worship of the other gods will make it worse. This is exactly what I'm talking about. White Harbor might have tension between worshippers of the Seven and the old gods, added to this other list of problems. And if men like black-bearded Artos Flint have their way, well, what does he mean by appeasing the old gods? What does that actually mean? Well, we have a few examples, and it's uh, pretty chilling. From the notion of executing Theon in front of a heart tree that Asha suggests instead of burning him, or Bran's vision of a similar killing in ancient days in front of the heart tree that he has in his vision after eating the werewood paste or the Jojen paste, there's also what Sir Bartimus told Davos that his ancestors used to do meaning hanging entrails in the tree for sacrifice as an offering to the old gods. Really, I can think, I can see a lot of these things happening. I, these might have been just small-scale versions of much bigger, worse versions of this when things get worse in the Winds of Winter. It's probably too late for Craster's version of sacrifice to make a difference, but I can imagine that happening too. Imagine male infants left for the others outside the gates of White Harbor in a hope that it'll appease them. It would probably take a lot of babies to keep them away from White Harbor, but Craster's attitude might not be so new unique. Some might stoop to stealing babies from others to give them up to the White Walkers. Some might give up their own child. Or where have I heard that before? Give up your own child in an effort to stop the oncoming darkness? Snow, snow demons, child sacrifice, burning people. I'm a believer and worrier that Shireen will be burned. Edric Storm and this sacrifice chapter are heavy foreshadowing for that. But another worry I have, one that's a lot less known, because I think the Shireen burning thing isn't, you've all heard this talked about before, but have you thought about Willis and his mental state? If Willis becomes Lord Willis, after the death of his father, which we've obviously predicted in many ways this episode, how is he going to face this? He had horrific experiences in the South, including his own brushes with cannibalism already, his own brushes with starvation. He's already faced monsters, not White Walker types, but Clegane, Hote, and Bolton, the closest thing we have to monsters in human skin. How is he going to handle the White Walkers if he's faced with that? I don't know that he'll be able to. But we did mention the fortitude of his daughter, Willa. Perhaps she will take a great leadership role, though that also raises the question of her older sister's fate. Hmm. Here's more art of Willa and Winifred by Furious Starfish Nerd. Winter may get her. Winifred, I mean. But I certainly don't think she'll end up burned at the stake. Still... Thinking of Shireen and Stannis helps us understand what's facing White Harbor and the Manderleys. Because what we expect to see at Winterfell and what we expect to see as a result of the extreme desperation and fear and all that other stuff, it's going to happen all over the North. And White Harbor is the biggest and most populous part of the North. It's one of the five true cities in Westeros. And it could set the tone for what we should expect if the others make it to any of the other cities. What happens at White Harbor may be telling for what happens at, say, Gulltown, which would be the next closest to south. Uh, Lannisport would be after that, then King's Landing, and maybe even if you go as far south as Old Town, you could see the others get that far, if Euron doesn't take it out first. 
Here's a tragic, epic thought for you, ice and fire fashion. Old Town burns while White Harbor freezes. It works if you expand the area, too. I mean, we don't have to just imagine one location in the north freezing, because we know the whole north is going to freeze, most likely. And in the south, there'll probably be plenty of burning in various places, even if Old Town doesn't happen to be one of them. After all, there's going to be multiple dragon claimants, even if only one side has dragons. That's still war, and war causes all sorts of burning. And heck, I haven't even mentioned Grayscale, which Val says doesn't die, but only sleeps. If that's true, then Shireen and others could add disease to the mix of horrors George R. R. Martin has in store for the North. Damn. <laughs> but let's just keep it simpler. Again, I said I wanted to stick to the high points. I threw some theories in there, but let's forget the specifics. Forget burning people at the stake. Forget Shireen. Forget cannibalism if you want, if you can. We don't know exactly how people will react. We just know that they'll have to. <laughs> There's no getting around the fact that winter is going to come. People are going to have to react to it. And the fact that they don't hardly even know the scope of winter because they only imagine it as a weather problem at this point. And in doing so, and in thinking about how they may react, that takes us to other places. And as we should do as often as possible, we consider the perspective of various personalities, not just the point of views. The Southerners have never seen anything like this, and it's pretty early still. So to contrast them, let's get another take. Even though we've seen snows deep enough to paralyze an army, some of the hardiest, oldest Northmen have seen much worse. They mock the snows and call it Autumn's Kiss, not even a true winter. No doubt many other Northerners feel the same. The Umbers at Last Hearth, surely they'd agree. We've, they've seen it worse too. And the Skags, and plenty of others. Even though these graybeards can laugh at Southerners for how little they've seen, they themselves have seen nothing yet. Not even the Starks' words of warning can testify to just how bad the truest winter of all could be. What Tormund and Mance have faced is coming for everyone else. John 12, A Dance with Dragons Tormund turned back. You know nothing. You killed a dead man, I, I heard. Mance killed a hundred. A man can fight the dead. But when their masters come, when the white mists rise up, how do you fight a mist, crow? Shadows with teeth? Air so cold it hurts to breathe, like a knife inside your chest. You do not know. You cannot know. Can your sword cut cold? So I'll say it again. What we've seen so far in terms of the horrors visited on the North is going to pale in comparison. Pale white in comparison. So much of this plot is hard to predict or even imagine. There's just so much we've yet to see and you can't reckon with George R. R. Martin's creativity. It's more than we can predict. But again, the inevitability of winter is just there. It's, it's perfectly there. We, we know it's not going to go away. We know it's not going to just say, oops, just kidding, psych. But how? How are we going to see it? Is it going to happen off screen for White Harbor? Is White Harbor going to fall off page? It's possible. I mean, we see, we'll probably see Winterfell firsthand. We might not need to see another important location fall in the north. But we might. We might. I could think of Davos maybe being there, maybe with Rickon. Maybe he gets out of Skagos, returns, and heads to White Harbor. Maybe he goes somewhere else, but it could be White Harbor. As a man of the seven, he's not exactly a big fan of prophecies, but he might live long enough to see some of the ones he's heard come true. And that might change his mind a bit. If he sees or hears of a real sword, like a, a weapon of fire, so to speak, made by the killing of a woman, he'll no doubt think of Nissa Nissa and Azor Ahai and Lightbringer, because he's heard that story. And once you see one prophecy come true... It's going to be hard to not think of the others and at least consider them a little more likely. Anything he's heard, be it from Sala or Melisandre, would all of a sudden be truly and legitimately possible, and that would be terrifying. If you're someone who's just like, ah, that's just talk, and all of a sudden one of them comes true, and all of a sudden you're really, wait, are all those things true? Are all the prophecies I've heard true? That's a terrifying total reversal of your position in the world and what's real. And man, that's, well, that's some Lovecraft stuff right there. But in order to be terrified by a prophecy, <laughs> in order to fear a vision of the future, 
you have to actually be aware that a vision of the future is what you're dealing with. You know, sometimes people just say things and they're prophetic or foreshadowing, but the characters don't necessarily notice. Sometimes it's only us readers that know that because it's not always so clear. Not all prophets call themselves prophets. They're not all Melisandre saying, I can read the future. Some of them are a little more subtle. And even when they're not subtle, we still don't necessarily know what they're all about. It's not a requirement that you declare yourself to be a prophet. That's just what Melisandre does. Maybe subtle isn't the right word for this other character because he's not really subtle. And there's something subtle about him though, and that's what I'm getting at. We readers know he's full of foreshadowing and prophecy, but only we readers. The characters in the story don't know it. Not Davos, not Shireen, not even Melisandre herself, who has a lot of experience with this sort of thing. She can recognize prophecy for what it is, but not this time. And in this case, it's because this character speaks in near gibberish. And who would suspect gibberish to be prophetic? Well, us readers, we, we suspect it. We, in fact, very much expect it. We look at it and we're like, ah, there's prophecy. But in the story, they don't know. But the day may come when someone or several someones, Davos, Melisandre, who knows, may realize that the ramblings of this certain mad jester are all coming true. The Fool from the Sea. As I said before, I love to analyze history because so often it tells us what's coming because it's a very fruitful endeavor, but it's hardly the only source, right? As much as George R. Martin likes to defy tropes, there's plenty he loves to embrace. Sometimes he puts a twist on those too. In this case, prophecy. It's a fantasy mainstay because it's essentially a more direct form of foreshadowing and foreshadowing was everywhere in liter literature and entertainment. This is just a device that makes that easier to communicate that fits into the story really well because, hey, we got magic. This is something we talk a lot about in our Dreams and Dreamers episode. But nothing in that episode, or really elsewhere, points directly to a fate for House Manderley and or White Harbor. A final source of what's to come for House Manderley may lie with this man, who is very associated with the Deep, a contradictory creature who comforts the easily scared Shireen, yet frightens the near-fearless Melisandre. Hmm. The Manderley sigil is of the Deep, and Lord Wyman has made a pact with the man the Deep returned to the surface. Probably because onions float, but still, Davos came back and lives on. But we're not speaking of Davos. Davos may have a big part in the destiny of House Manderley, but Patchface may have been giving us tidbits of their future all along. Patchface, like the Ghost of High Heart, has predicted several major events in the series already. A few they've both predicted, like the Red and Purple Weddings. So when you have a character that has several prophecies come true, like we just use an example of a character in world realizing that one prophecy is true. So shoot, maybe some of these other prophecies are true. Same is true with Patchface. If a bunch of his prophecies have come true, what about the rest that haven't come true yet? Because they probably will. Uh, the problem is that unlike the ghost of Highheart, Patchface is a crazy person <laughs> and his words are as much riddle as they are prophecy. And let me level with you. I do not have a lot of answers when it comes to Patchface. Most of the time on the show, we connect the dots and try to explain what it all means, what the possibilities are, or what else might be related. But with Patchface, <laughs> in most cases, we do not have explanations. The riddles are too hard to get around in a lot of cases. Well, at least we have certain keywords that seem related. And yeah, well, let's throw these out here and y'all can make your own in interpretations alongside uh, what I've got for you. This, this first line here, very striking. The crow, the crow, Patchface cried when he saw John. Under the sea, the crows are white as snow. I know, I know. Oh, oh, oh. So if by crows he's talking about members of the Night's Watch, which he seems to be based on his reaction to John, then, uh-oh, <laughs> there aren't a lot of ways to interpret that as a positive. Maybe he's only talking about John, though, predicting his stabbing. <laughs> it's like best case scenario that it's only John's death. But... It, has a dark interpretation possible as well. Meaning they march into winter and come out the other side as walking dead, as undead, as whites, you know, white, white, etc. So pick your poison <laughs> for those interpretations. But if by white crows, he's talking about white ravens, which is kind of hard to miss that 
possibility at least. It may not be the right parallel, but it's, it's certainly suggested. White crow, white raven. Well, that's a reference to winter, which in this case, if it's true, means that under the sea is a euphemism for winter itself. But then he goes and says this, it is always summer under the sea. The merwives wear nanny moans in their hair and weave gowns of silver seaweed. I know, I know. It's hard for under the sea to mean winter if it's always summer under the sea, but here we are. To make it worse, well, what's tougher than a riddle prophecy? All riddle prophecy using an extremely obscure word. In this case, nanny moans? What the heck is a nanny moan? We're pretty sure it's anemone because, well, I couldn't find a real definition for nanny moan anywhere, so it's probably an enemy. Anyway, when John is planning the mission to hard home, Patchface jumps in with, I will lead it. We will march into the sea and out again. Under the waves, we will ride seahorses and mermaids will blow seashells to announce our coming. Oh, oh, oh. The use of we there is ominous. He might like it underwater because, well, he came back from all that. He drowned and somehow survived. But according to Cotter Pike and the letter he sent John, there are dead things in that water. I don't want to go in that water. And in the sea, if it's winter in this case, he's saying they'll go into it and out of it again. Okay, well, that's a positive, I guess. Surviving winter, going into winter and coming back out of it on the other side. That's, that implies survival. I guess that's a positive interpretation but blowing seashells and then saying, oh, three times? Yikes, three blasts to announce our coming. That's what they do to warn the watch when the White Walkers come. If the seashell and mermaid and seahorse references point to White Harbor, then this could be a prophecy of doom for the North's only city. He also says, under the sea, the mermen feast on starfish soup and all the serving men are crabs. Well, this is a particularly tough one, and it's mostly included because it's got mermen and starfish and also crabs, but serving men are crabs, I almost, it seems like feasting on corpses in a bit. It kind of seems like that. Another interpretation is that White Harbor will be able to feed itself through a siege by supply from the sea. Lots of possibilities here, too. Whatever Patchface's words really mean, it's pretty certain it's hard to imagine that they're not related to the North. This last one that I just read is the one that prompts Melisandre to speak her mind about him and what she's seen, and it's not positive either. Now, it's easy to dismiss Melisandre's prophecies because of how often she misreads her visions, but look at what she actually says about Patchface. A dance with dragons. John, ten. That creature is dangerous. Many a time I have glimpsed him in my flames. Sometimes there are skulls about him, and his lips are red with blood. I really... If that's what she sees around him, well, maybe she's right on this one. I mean, she's not wrong all the time, right? But if we're entertaining how she could be wrong, and we should since she's wrong so often... Maybe the vision is meant to be taken literally, and she will see him literally in her flames. Or in the flames. Him burning, maybe because he tries to save Shireen. John wonders at that possibility himself, thinking, John 10, a dance with dragons. I wonder you haven't had the poor man burned. All it would take was a word in the queen's ear, and Patchface would feed her fires. Yep, so <laughs> the possibility is suggested right there. It won't be good for the North in any case, I'm thinking, however it plays out. White Harbor has far worse than Freys and Boltons to worry about. They have prophecies and gods on top of that. And winter is coming. And what I see is a house that got kicked out of one region and survived to learn a lot of lessons from that experience. Instead of getting on the wrong side of the King of the Reach, they have done nothing but stay on the right side of the Starks in Winterfell. And so they work to see a Stark in Winterfell again, even if it means their own blood must be sacrificed to make it happen. If Lord Wyman's descendants are half the man he is, no, really, no pun intended that time. Seriously. <laughs> the Starks will return, and they will be able to continue trusting in their great, unlikely allies. Even as things get worse, and I do mean the others, House Manderley will be ready. Well, they'll be loyal and brave, even if they're not ready. <laughs> 
their resources, their trade network, their army, their control over the surrounding area, their family history of managing wealth, and their history of ambition all combine to make them extremely formidable and interesting. To many other ruling houses, this might be a reason for concern, but their unwavering loyalty to House Stark has ensured their place rather than threatened it. They know what to emphasize. If you're going to be big, make sure you're loyal so that no one has a reason to be threatened by your bigness. You can't say that they are the most loyal of the Northerners, given others who are just as staunch, if not more so, and for longer, but those are, to be fair, lesser allies. They're not as important as the Mandalese. None of them have the power of White Harbor. None have the best of the North and South combined in one house. Who would have thought that the wolf's most powerful ally would be a merman? But they're going to need that and a lot more if White Harbor and Winterfell are going to survive the long, cold, and night black winds of winter. It's funny, not funny, haha, -ha, but funny that we might see the Manderleys who fled north to get away from the south having to flee back south because of an even worse enemy. We'll have to wait and see. Ashea is the best. She was behind the camera as usual, taking charge of production and a lot of other things behind the scenes. Of course, that was also Ashea you heard doing some of the factoid bits there that are placed throughout the episode. Guest voices include Sean of House Beard and introducing Camille Stoner. Yep, that's her real name. And of course, Martin Lewis, AKA Echoes of Ice and Fire. Joe Buckley contributed a large amount of the writing for this episode. Thanks also to Rainey's Targaryen for helping with the fact-checking and suggestions. Also to Nina Friel for the same. Michael Klarfeld did the video intro and the maps you see behind us. Joey Townsend and Jesse Koval did the music, which includes the theme song at the beginning and the cover of the theme song at the end. Thanks to our patrons, including no one. Our peers of the realm include the mysterious BR, Hand of the King. Lady Suzanne Sinistral, the learned, holder of the left-handed Valerian shields called Penance, Hand of the Beard. Lord Jim the Fortuitous of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire and Warden of the West. Lord George Stormsville the Cunning, Lord of the Chiliad and Warden of the East. Cabeth the Unfrozen, Lord of the Bricks and Castle Crimson Light, Defender of the Old Gods and Warden of the North. Lady Kelly McMath of Covington is Lady of the Villa Hills and Crescent Springs, Warden of the South. Lord James Tuttle is King of the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea, Commander of the Royal Fleet, consisting of the Narrow Fleet led by Flagship Caraxes and the Bloodstone Fleet led by Flagship Prince Damon. Charlotte Oster is Corsair Queen of the Western Shivering Sea, Commander of the Briny Fleet, whose flagship is the barnacle-encrusted Violet Hulled Mercenaria. She carries the Naker-inlaid Shucking Blade Crasslover. The two fleets have engaged in friendly competition in seeing who can catch the most Merlings. So far, the count is zero to zero. We'll keep you posted. Our small council includes Lord James Inkblade, the Scholar Knight, Master of Whisperers, Lord Robert Jacobs, Master of Coin, and Lord Daniel, the Sneaky Russian, Master of Ships. Lady Dyerliz of Castle Naki is the Alpha Patron. Lord Dan of the Red Mountains and Castle Great Bell is Breaker of the Second Stone. Lord Skip of the Velt is Lord of Castle Ganges. Gregor the Toasty is Lord of the Breadfort. Alicia Everlasting of the Greenblood is Lady of Desert Rose. Lord Ryan of Castle Stonegate is Guardian of the Rocky Mountain Pass. Lord Garen de Havilland is of Devil's Hand Keep. Ashlyn Winter of the Hawk's Eye is Lady of Castle Skyfall. Lady Mikkel of Moonacre is Leader of the Werewood Protectorate Alliance. The Lord of the Halls of Castle Hillcrest is Wielder of the Valyrian Steel Machete Everglazed. Lord Alistair Whitaker is Lord of the Dawnhold. Lord Bemmy Snugglebunny is Guardian of the Hidden Hundred Acre Werewood, Dual Wielding Glorious Morning and Little Light Wise. Brian the Defender is Lord of the Spearfort and the Freelands, Last Scion of Clan McCulloch, Strength and Courage. The Bastard of the Wolfswood is First Forester of the Old Gods, Sworn to House Iron Werewood. Listen for the silence. Connor the Dungeon Master is Lord of Catamount Keep and Guardian of the Smoky Mountain Pass. Lady Baelish is Dark Widow of Harrenhal. Lord Sidney Jesse is the Fallborn, Lord of Blue Spring. Nevesa the Twinhearted, a suspected skin changer, is holder of Castle Karahelm. Sir Valentin of House to Jen is creator of the Game of Predictions, free Game of Thrones Predictions Futures Market. Link is on our website. Lady Leona Kelly of Wolf Island is Protectors of the Steelhold. And Casey Stark of House Acres. Our King's Justice is Sir Troy the Steady, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Blade Fate. 
Lady Jane of House Celtigar as the Emerald of the Evening, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Axe Painkiller, Mistress of Sea Eagles and Mistress of Ships, Elia of Upstate as Master of Coin, Bold Betha of House Copperhook, Still Waters Run Deep as Master of Laws. Our Kingsguard is led by the Smiling Wolf, Lord Commander Stephen Stark, cartographer of kings who earned a white cloak through wisdom and learning as much as skill at arms. Lord Stephen hosted us at his house at Con of Thrones 2018 for the first day, as well as a birthday party for James of Smokescreen's channel. How about that? Thanks, Stephen. Our Queen's Guard is led by Lord Captain Commander Hema Helmet, the Sellsword Sentinel, Lady Nymeria of House Seapurtle, Alexander of House Atreides, from the Seat of Dune, I Must Not Fear, Fear is the Mind Killer. Becca the Bard is Songbird of the North. Sir Eric Redbeard Odinson is Wielder of Tempest, a monstrous warhammer. Michonne the Melodious is Star of Old Town, Minds Over Masters. And Sir Rambo is Knight of House Ganon, First Blood. The Beard Guard is led by Lord Commander George the Golden, Sir Joshua Oakhart, the White Oak, Sir Joff, Warden of the AC, Wielder of Triad, the multifaceted beard of platinum, red, and brown. Stay frosty. Sir Tim Cargoyle, Mad Boy of the Western Desert. And I don't normally like to play favorites, but I'm going to give a little extra appreciation to Lady Rita of the Coppermane, the Unbound. Dance the fervor. Welcome to Maester Prax of Ganymede. Welcome to Pat Woods Witch of the Forked Path and Cotter Goodbarrel, Seer Through Glass Candles, Mage of Ashai. Also Firefly Phoenix and Sir Jack the Piebane Manderly. And of course, Lord Commander Benjen Umber, the Silent Giant, wielder of Valyrian Steel Greatsword Winter's Kiss, First Ranger Fabian Flowers, the Bastard of Greenshield, First Builder Patchface of Motley Wisdom, and First Steward Sir Jurion of the Torrentine Call, Tailwind. Also thanks to Sir Goodkill McGee of McGeesville, Frog Wolf the Wanderer, Sam Snow, the Ghost of White Harbor, Scott Alexander, the Prince of Dragonflies, and Willina, the Wisdom of White Harbor. See you next time for another episode, and till then, Valar re us.